Good morning. Welcome to Let in the Workplace, the New Science. I'm Barbara Plogg. I'm the director of the Continuing Education Program for the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. COEH, as we call it, is a NIOSH Education and Resource Center, Education and Research Center, excuse me, and we are very happy to have you here today in Berkeley and online, and our good morning to our audience online. A couple of housekeeping details for people here. Emergency exits, just in the unlikely event we should get an earthquake today. Uh, there are two emergency exits, the door which you entered on your right and a door in the corner on your left. And either one will lead you, the one on the, your left will lead you straight outside, the one on your right will lead you to the lobby. If we do have an earthquake, duck and hold till the sh shaking start stops and then uh, exit and we'll take stock. So we'll exit out through the lobby onto the sidewalk and we'll all have a fine time. <laughs> the restrooms, a more likely event that you'll need the restrooms. <laughs> exit out the right door th um, through which you entered. Turn left and go down the hallway, both ladies' and men's restrooms. I want to just quickly go through the packet of material that re you received this morning, if you'll take that out. You'll see that on the left-hand side is the agenda, a sheet that tells you how many continuing education credits you can earn at this seminar. And we have a sign-up sheet outside for uh, nursing credits and CMEs for physicians. Otherwise, you'll be getting a certificate for the, um, a general certificate which, for, for which you can claim your hours with. Go back a little bit and you'll come to a yellow sheet. That's the evaluation for today. We would like you to take it out and fill it out as we go through the day and hand it to us at the end of the day. And online folks, you also have an evaluation sheet that we'd like you to fill out. And then on the right side of your packet are the slides for today's presenters. So it'll make it easier to take notes. So I have the pleasure this morning of introducing our moderator for the day, Dr. John Howard. John Howard is the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Dr. Howard also serves as the, as the administrator of the World Trade Center Health Program in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Howard was first appointed in 2002 during the George Bush administration and served in that position until 2008. In 2008 and 2009, he's worked as a consultant with the U.S. government's Afghanistan Health Initiative. In September 2009, Dr. Howard was again appointed NIOSH director in the Obama administration. Prior to his appointments as NIOSH director, he served as chief of the Division of Occupational Safety and Health, or as we know it here in California, Cal OSHA. He served in that position from 1991 through 2002. So we're, we're welcoming, him, welcoming, welcoming him back to the state today. <laughs> Dr. Howard received his Doctor of Medicine degree from Loyola University, a Master's of Public Health degree from Harvard School of Public Health, a Master of Law degree in Administrative Law and Economic Regulation from George Washington University. He's board certified in internal medicine and occupational medicine. And we're very happy to have him here today. Thank you, Barbara. 
Thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to join all of you and thank the uh, Center for Occupational Environmental Health uh, at uh, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and UCSF. Um, I also wanted to thank the David Brower Center, this wonderful auditorium that we're in, uh, for their cooperation uh, to hold this seminar. I want to thank Brian and Ilana, who are our RT support, Mary, who is our timekeeper, and, uh, and all of you who have joined us today and have traveled uh, from quite a distance. We have 110 folks registered here from four different states. Uh, we have 73 individuals on uh, the web site um, from 17 different states and four different countries. Uh, and we have 42 groups registered of multiple people from 13 different states. So I want to thank all of you for making time in your busy schedule for traveling uh, for science sake. Uh, it's extremely important uh, that we uh, are all here today. Just to uh, give you an explanation of the format uh, for today, we're going to have three presentations this morning uh, on uh, the various scientific dimensions of, uh, of lead in the workplace. Uh, two of the presentations are going to be back to back. They will break for lunch. Uh, there's plenty of places to eat here. Just follow your nose or ask a local uh, where to eat. Uh, we're going to then have a question and answer period uh, in the afternoon uh, after our four discussants uh, who will get 10 minutes each to respond to the three presentations uh, in the morning and early afternoon uh, will we'll be able to, uh, to ask questions. Now, the way we're going to do questions, uh, we'd like you for everyone here in the room to put your question on a white card any time during the day and put it in that lovely bowl there on the table so that we can look at it, organize it, uh, and, uh, and be efficient in asking uh, the discussants and the panelists uh, their, uh, their responses. For those of you uh, on the web, uh, there is, uh, you can ask questions via ReadyTalk. Uh, there's a help button if you have problems with that. Uh, and, uh, and we welcome all of your questions uh, for folks on the web. Uh, we realize that people may have uh, issues they want to think about or they want to ask the presenters later on. Uh, so if you'd like to follow up about a specific question, uh, then the contact information for the speakers and the panelists uh, is, uh, is in your packet. Uh, this is a science symposium. Uh, it's a science symposium for the nation. Uh, so we're not interested in uh, issues that relate to regulatory matters. We're not interested in any particular state's orientation uh, or the U.S. orientation. We're talking about science today and all of its applications and, and dimensions. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the organizers for having this symposium. It's extremely important. Lead, as you know, has been with us uh, for many, many thousands of years. It's still with us. We're still struggling with it. Uh, to protect not only workers, uh, but also the general population. So we're going to start right away with our first presenter, Michael Kosnett, who is an associate clinical professor in the Division of Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and an associate adjunct professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. Prior to moving to Colorado in the 1990s, he was a member of the Occupational Medicine and Medical Toxicology faculties at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Kosnett has had a long-standing clinical and research interest in the health effects of lead and other heavy metals. He has served on several EPA science advisory board panels pertaining to lead in air, dust, and water, and on the CDC Advisory Committee on Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention. He has written and lectured extensively in the U.S. and abroad on the clinical evaluation and management of lead exposure in adults and children. Dr. Kuznick. Thank you, Dr. Howard. It's a, a, a pleasure to uh, be here. I, I uh, Always enjoy coming back uh, to California. I went to medical school here and um, began my work uh, and my interest in lead um, more than 30 years ago. And today uh, is a great opportunity to uh, talk to you about uh, where we've come uh, as a scientific community, actually, in the past several decades. And so uh, we're just launching up here, and um, we'll begin. No, this is, this is mine. 
That, that wasn't it. Great. Okay, great. We're going to talk a lot um, today about blood lead and, and how it relates um, to various health effects, particularly in the occupational setting. And lead in whole blood is the most common you know, clinical measurement that has been used uh, over, over the past 50 or more so years to assess and evaluate a worker's exposure to lead. Now, the OSHA lead construction, the OSHA standards, both in construction and general industry, were adopted in the mid to late 1970s. And a blood lead concentration of 50 micrograms per deciliter um, has remained um, actually since the OSHA construction standard for lead was developed at 50 micrograms per deciliter, where it is today, and that a person can return to work when their blood lead concentration falls below 40. Now, at the time that the OSHA standards, the, particularly the general industry standard, um, was adopted, the average blood lead concentration in the United States was in the teens. The geometric mean was 12.8. Today, we know that lead has fallen dramatically across the country in terms of the, the overall exposure as a consequence of the phase out of lead and gasoline, um, the uh, curtailment of the use of lead-based paints, and also d uh, diminished use of lead in canned food. And the average uh, blood lead concentration in the United States is 1.1. As we have seen these dramatic decreases, and science has shown us and, and has elucidated effects of lead at lower levels of exposure, we recognize scientifically, and that's one of the things I hope to uh, discuss with you today, that these standards that were developed in the late uh, 1970s are insufficiently protective of the health of workers and need to be revised. This, the challenge is not just here in California and in the United States, but the challenge and the necessity for this is worldwide. This is a, a chart I developed uh, prior to a talk that I gave in Prague uh, two years ago. Um, when looking around the world at various standards for lead uh, in the workplace and levels that necessitate removal. And as you can see, um, they're all rather pretty high um, relative to today's prevailing blood lead concentrations. And uh, the UK and Japan and Russia are uh, you know, at 60 and 50, and even some of the European countries, which are a bit lower, are still in the range of 25 to 40. Now, why am I concerned that these uh, standards are insufficiently protective? I base that on the fact that in recent decades, there's been considerable body of work that shows that the chronic effects of cumulative lead exposure have contributed to substantial public health problems, particularly hypertension and cardiovascular disease. There is some evidence to indicate that lead may have adverse effects on renal function at lower levels and at cognitive dysfunction, particularly uh, in adults, con contributions of cognitive dysfunction that appear and become more manifest later in life. And then there's also concerns about the acute effects of lead on reproductive function. And I want to outline for you some of the most important work that I believe has come forward. I don't have time in this short presentation to give you a comprehensive review of the topic. It's enormous. But I want to show you about some studies that I think are particularly well uh, conducted and particularly influential and are persuasive to us as a public health community in acknowledging the fact that we need to be concerned about lower levels of lead exposure. Let's for, uh, talk first about the relationship between lead and blood pressure. This has been studied through a coherent group of different experiments and observations. There's been animal studies where you can uh, feed animals lead and they develop high blood pressure. There's been extensive study of in vitro and, uh, in vi um, and 
mechanisms in biological preparations, such as the tail arteries of rodents that have been exposed to lead, which establish mechanistic basis for how lead can contribute to increased vascular tone and increased blood pressure. And perhaps most significantly, there's been substantial human epidemiological evidence. This is uh, not a new study, but I think it's a, an elegant one uh, that was conducted by Dr. Fine and published in the journal Toxicology and Applied Pharmacology um, in the late 1980s. And what he did is he took six uh, three-month-old female dogs and their matched litter mates, and he fed them lead acetate or placebo for five months. And the dogs were trained, and they were able to get without uh, any kind of sedation, they were able to take blood pressure measurements in, in these dogs. And at 15 weeks of age, the, the dogs who were exposed to lead had a blood pressure, of th uh, excuse me, a blood lead of 35.8, and the uh, controls had 9.2. And look at the blood pressure difference. The blood pressure in the lead exposed dogs was 120, and those in the uh, control dogs was 108. And this is a chart uh, from that paper. The, the uh, hatch marks here are the lead exposed, uh, the blood pressure in the lead exposed dogs. And you can see at all these age points, the dogs exposed to lead had a higher blood pressure. This increase that you're seeing here in the first uh, uh, weeks of life is just uh, what happens with puppies as they become older, even the control animals raise their blood pressure. But there's definitely that decrement here. Now this is done in dogs. Uh, uh, studies that are often done in higher mammals as opposed to rodents are more relevant to humans. But I have to tell you, this has not just been done in dogs. It's been done in other animals. Uh, the effects have been seen in rabbits and been seen in mice and rats and many other animals. What about humans? And let's turn to the epidemiological evidence because the epidemiological database is particularly interesting and relevant. And a unique I issue, and I think I want to particularly emphasize to you, is that when we talk about concerns for low-level lead exposure in the workplace, for example, lead levels in the teens, we can take advantage of the fact that the human general population lead exposure that occurred uh, prior to the uh, 1980s actually was in the teens. Remember I said on my, on my earlier slide that the geometric mean lead, blood lead concentration in the United States uh, in the NHANES uh, 2 study was 12.8? There were basically millions of people in our country, many of us in this room, most of us probably in this room, who had blood levels in the teens. So there, the, general, the studies that have been conducted in the general population that existed at that time of the relationship between lead and various endpoints is very relevant when we're talking about occupational lead exposure in the range of 10 to 20. So let's look at this particular study, which was um, conducted in the NHANES database, the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation uh, survey, which uh, has been conducted uh, multiple times by the Centers for Disease Control. They had, of approximately 20,000 people that they examined and reviewed their health status in detail, about a little less than half of them had blood lead measurements. At the time, in this particular uh, uh, cohort, the, the uh, mean blood lead concentration was 13.1, and they found in modeling that blood lead was significantly associated with both systolic and diastolic blood pressure after they controlled for age, body mass index, a number of demographic factors, and multiple nutritional factors that uh, could possibly relate to hypertension. After they inserted numerous, numerous variables that are present and collected in the NHANES database, the relationship between lead in blood and blood pressure remained robust. A companion paper to this was published um, by Dr. Perkle in 1985 using this same NHANES data set, and he decided to focus in on, for this, for purposes of illustration in this study, on white males between the ages of 40 to 59. And he, he uh, had approximately, he had um, 564 uh, individuals in that data set. 
And this regression line is based on all 564. He's reduced it for purposes of illustration to 25 data points, but each of these points represents a coalescence of the nearest uh, 22 or 23 uh, observations. But one of the things I want you to see here is that after they adjusted for important covariates, uh, age, body mass index, uh, cigarette smoked, numerous nutritional variables, they found that as you increased blood lead from about 6 to 38, you had a 10-point increase in diastolic blood pressure. And that's a very substantial increase uh, in terms of public health. And one of the things he actually did in his paper is he looked at uh, this slope, this relationship, and he, and he, he looked at the Framingham Heart Study, which looked at the relationship between bl blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, and he said this will have a major, I mean, this contribution has a major contribution to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And he predicted that if we lowered blood lead, we would see an improvement. And uh, his observations are actually prescient, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some, some data which actually shows the relationship between lead and cardiovascular disease shortly. Now, this study was conducted in a very large and very uh, reliable data set, the NHANES data set, but there have been multiple other studies that have been conducted on the relationship between lead and high blood pressure. And these are charts of two uh, meta-analyses which have been published, one by Joel Schwartz in 1995, um, one by Narot et al. in 2002. Um, and I don't want you to, the, 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 the small print here of the various studies is not what I want to illustrate here. What I want to illustrate here is that when you double blood pressure, when you go from 5 to 10 um, and you look at the change, look at all these studies. What do you notice? There's a, a very strong preponderance of all the studies pointing in the same direction. And the same thing here. Here, Dr. Schwartz said what would happen in, the, in terms of decrease if you went from 10 to 5, but it's a linear relationship, so it's basically the increase you would see if you went from uh, five to 10. And what you notice is all the studies are leaning in the same direction. You know, when I look at something like this and I see multiple studies pointing in the same direction with similar intensity and they're performed in different populations by different investigators at different points in time of people with different levels of blood lead and they're all seeing the basic same thing, it really in increases your confidence in, in, the, in the relationship. You know, it's very quite possible that an isolated study would be flawed or subject to confounding. But when you see th this many studies showing the same trend, you really have to be impressed with the underlying uh, causal relationship. And you have to be impressed, too, because it's not just epidemiology. You have the animal experiments, where you're exposing animals, and you have the mechanistic studies, which look at the effects of lead on vascular tone and tissue involving things like calcium and, and uh, oxidative stress that also support these observations. Now, one of the things you might think about is, okay, if you double blood lead concentration, and this, this relationship is for a doubling of blood. blood. I, I illustrated here to 5 to 10. It could be for 10 to 20. You might say, well, uh, there's only a one millimeter or, or, or 1.25 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure. Is that significant? Well, you know, that's an average across the whole population study. And it's quite possible with an endpoint like blood pressure that not everyone has similar sensitivities. Um, take, for example, this observation here. This is a hypothetical data set in which you have some people for which there's a very strong relationship between blood lead and blood pressure, but you have a lot of people that aren't sensitive at all. Okay? You would still see this positive relationship. Now, if you had a data set like that, you would see a significant slope, but you might see a lot of variability or a low R squared. And you might see uh, heterogeneity in the avariance or heteroscedasticity. And in fact, Many studies have actually shown that. And it's quite possible that some people have a very strong relation, uh, are very sensitive to lead-induced blood pressure, and that the average for them of a doubling would be much more than one millimeter. Okay. Um, think, if you will, for another ion 
that uh, is very important in blood pressure, sodium. But not everyone has sodium sensitive blood pressure. So when you see a mean of maybe one or two millimeters, bear in mind that that could be driven by people for which there's a very substantial increase that's in excess of that. And also bear in mind that what we looked at in this previous, uh, these previous studies was the, met, the relationship between blood pressure and lead in blood. And lead in blood, while it's the most um, overall useful uh, biomonitor of, an, of the amount of lead circulating in the body at a given point in time, is not necessarily a reliable indicator of a person's long-term cumulative lead exposure. Greater than 90% of the lead in, in the body, and, and perhaps greater than 95% in adults, is found in the skeleton, where it has a half-life of years to decades. And there is a technology called non-invasive measurement of lead in bone by K-X-ray fluorescence, depicted in this photograph here, which has enabled individuals to measure non-invasively the lead concentration of the bone. And studies that have compared people's cumulative lead exposure by looking at blood lead over time have found that there's a very good correlation between a single 30-minute measurement. This man is sitting here and getting his uh, um, bone lead uh, measure, measurement conducted over a 30-minute period. The x-ray, by the way, the radiation exposure associated with this is less than a single dental bite wing x-ray. This single measurement is a good um, indicator of that individual's cumulative lead exposure. And this picture was actually uh, taken by Dr. Todd, uh, who uh, is the colleague of Dr. Landrigan, who, who is going to speak with us later. But this is from one of the investigations at, uh, done at Mount Sinai. Now, blow, bone lead has therefore been used as a marker of cumulative lead exposure, and there's been some very important and powerful observations made about the relationship between cumulative lead exposure as expressed by measurements of lead in bone and cardiovascular outcomes, including hypertension. And this uh, paper that I'm uh, going to talk to you about was one that was published in JAMA in 1996, and it took advantage of the normative aging study. The normative aging study, many of you might know about it, was a a uh, prospective cohort study that began in, in 1961 in the greater Boston area. And they enrolled 2,280 healthy community-dwelling men in a study. And no one was allowed into the study if they had heart disease, if they had asthma, if they had lung disease, diabetes, cancer. They had to be healthy people. They couldn't have high blood pressure. And the idea was we're going to follow this cohort of healthy men who were, I think, at the time between the ages of 20 to 80, and we're going to follow them forward, and we're going to see how, what diseases they develop and how that might relate to various dietary things, other things in their life, that uh, other exposures they may have had. Beginning in 1988, they started measuring uh, blood lead, and beginning in 1991, uh, at, with Dr. Hu and his group at Harvard, they started measuring bone lead. And then, in, after a period of time when they had uh, accrued d uh, data, they decided to conduct a case control study. They looked at 146 of these men who were hypertensive and uh, 442 match controls who had a mean age of about 66, and they looked at what would predict who developed hypertension. And mind you, this is a general population sample. These aren't lead workers. These are people who, are, who work in banks, who are clerical workers, retail people. Some of them are blue collar, some of them are white collar. The wide diversity of occupations. The average, uh, the mean blood lead at the time was 6.3 micrograms per deciliter. And they found that of all the different variables they looked at, there were only three things that predicted who would get, who would develop hypertension. One of them was body mass index, one of them was whether you had a family history of hypertension, and one of them was the tibia concentration of lead. Okay. This is a general population sample of men in the United States. Of all the various things that would predict that whether you're hypertensive, lead was one of them, and the long-term cumulative exposure. It wasn't blood lead, it was bone lead, a measure of long-term cumulative exposure. And in fact, going from the lowest quintile of bone lead 
to the highest quintile, which was 29 micrograms per gram, the odds of being hypertensive increased by 50 percent, an odds ratio of 1.5. And we'll return to this point in a moment. But it wasn't just this study that found that. There, was another, there were other studies that found this as well. And I think this study is very interesting, too. Also done by the Harvard group, the lead author here was uh, Susan Corrick, who also worked with Dr. Who. And they decided they would look at the nurse's health study. And they took a subset. The nurse's, nurse's health study is a very large prospective cohort study of nurses and their, and their health. Um, and they decided to look at 89 hypertensive nurses and 195 controls to see what would predict in a logistic model um, what, made, uh, what, what were con contributing factors to hypertension. And they found that bone lead was, the bone lead of nurses was a contributing factor, a significant contributing factor. Uh, after adjustment for age, body mass index, dietary sodium, and again, family history of hypertension, when you went from the 10th percentile to the, 30, uh, to the 90th percentile, you had an odds ratio for hypertension of 1.86. And the blood lead concentration of the nurses at this time was three. So, and nurses are not particularly exposed to lead. What was their exposure? Their exposure, these nurses were exposed to the lead that they grew up with when they were um, most, because, you know, these nurses uh, were, were uh, many, they, these are, nurses were particularly uh, growing up at a period of time when blood leads were in the teens. And those who had more blood lead relative to the others had a significant, uh, I mean, bone lead uh, had a significant increase of developing hypertension. Now, let's go back and look at this. We're talking about bone lead increments. Remember I said in Dr. Who's study that the increment of 29 micrograms per gram was associated with an odds ratio for hypertension of 1.5? Well, we know that bone lead measurements in terms of concentration are related to cumulative blood lead exposure. And there have been studies where they've measured and calculated what's called a cumulative blood lead index. So for example, if you had a lead level of 20 micrograms per deciliter in your blood for 10 years, your cumulative index would be 200. Okay. The relationship, the slope between uh, bone lead and cumulative blood lead index is roughly 0 0.05. So that 29 microgram per gram increment that Dr. Hu saw translates into 580 microgram per deciliter years. Well, let's think about that in terms of a lifetime of lead exposure in the workplace. If you were exposed for 40 years, a 15 microgram per deciliter increase over that 40 years would, would equal that cumulative bone lead, which produced you know, 600, 40 years of 15 microgram per deciliter difference between, say, a blood lead of 25 compared to a blood level of 10 is equivalent to the lead level that might increase your blood pressure, your odds of having hypertension, excuse me, by, fi by 50 percent. Okay? So if we could avert that cumulative blood lead index by, say, not having a blood lead of 25 in the workplace, but having one of 10 for a working lifetime, we might be able to avert that increase in risk that Dr. Who found. Now, if you were to say to me or to someone else that I have a risk factor that is going to increase hypertension, you would expect that you would see an increase in cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality because hypertension is a very well-known and very well-established risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. And in fact, studies that have been conducted on the NHANES data set in which they observed a relationship between lead and blood pressure have recently found that, indeed, elevated blood lead was associated with an increased risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. And this was a paper that was published in Environmental Health Perspectives in 2006 that was a 12-year longitudinal study of participants in the NHANES who were greater than 40 years of age at the time that they were studied, and almost 10,000 people. And compared to a reference population of those who had 
or a reference subset within this population who had blood leads less than five. Those who had blood leads five to nine had a, a 1.2 relative risk of dying of cardiovascular disease, and those who had blood leads greater than 10 had a 55% increase, relative risk of 1.55. This was an average of 8.5 years of follow-up. Most of these people had blood, the median was 11.8, and almost very, very few people in this, in this data set had blood leads greater than 20. And this clearly shows that, and this was after adjusting for sex, race, ethnicity, education, and smoking status. This really shows that in this population of, who had blood leads in the teens, an older population who grew up with most of their life with blood leads in the teens, there was a significant relationship between the risk of, um, of dying from cardiovascular disease and their lead exposure. The normative aging study took this a step further because they had the bone lead measurements. And this is the same study I mentioned earlier by Dr. Hu, the same data set. Uh, Dr. Weisskopf, working with Dr. Hu and his colleagues, um, looked prospectively at the men who they had obtained bone lead measurements on and followed them forward um, for a period of years, average of uh, 8.9 years of follow-up. And they said, they looked at, they had very well, uh, almost 100% ascertainment of, of mortality and type of mortality. And they looked at who died of cardiovascular disease as a function of their accumulative lead exposure reflected in bone. And it was pretty striking. If you looked at the entire population, the highest tercile of bone lead compared to the lowest tercile had a 2.45 fold risk of dying of heart disease. If you looked at those who didn't have heart disease or stroke at the time of the prospective follow-up, it was a five-fold, greater than five-fold increase in the risk of dying. One of the key things I want you to, if you, if you Remember nothing else from this talk. One of the key things I want you to, to take home is the fact that in occupational health, we're often concerned about very subtle endpoints. Sometimes we regulate and we're concerned when someone has a slight increase in liver enzymes, or we have a subtle effect on, on reaction time or something like that. Okay? There's nothing subtle about death. Okay? <laughs> this is the most severe and compelling endpoint you could possibly have in occupational health. And we're showing that cumulative lead exposure, predominantly in the teens, across ranges in the teens, increases the risk of death. Okay? And that is something that is very compelling, I think, as we consider the hazards. Let's, um, you know, one of the things to bear in mind is, well, why might, well, how is lead causing this cardiovascular mortality. Is it due to hypertension? It may be due in part to hypertension, but it's certainly not entirely due to hypertension because factors independent of hypertension may contribute very well to this cardiovascular mortality based on the various effects of lead that we have recognized. We know that lead causes oxidative stress. There have been studies that have shown that lead's been associated in human epidemiological studies with pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNS-alpha, alters endothelial cell function. In the N uh, normative aging study and other studies, there have been associations of lead with alterations in cardiac conduction, such as prolonged QT and QRS intervals. So it's not all about hypertension. And in fact, here's another study that Menke uh, looked at based on uh, a prospective longitudinal analysis of participants in the NHANES study. And what he showed here, comparing the lowest tercile of blood lead to the highest tercile of blood lead, not only was there an increased risk in, in mortality from myocardial infarction, but from stroke as well. And that's uh, significant because some of the things that affect uh, the integrity of the vasculature in the heart will certainly also affect the cerebrovascular uh, circulation. And so there's also, uh, in this study, controlling for other factors, a substantial increase in the risk of stroke. 
Turn to a moment uh, to the relationship between lead and renal function. Several studies, and this study on the, uh, that I'm highlighting here are just one of several, that have shown a relationship between creatinine clearance, which is a measure of renal function, and blood lead concentration. This particular study was conducted in Europe among a group of individuals who uh, lived in uh, various communities where they had a wide range of uh, lead exposures. Um, anywhere from 1.7 to 72.5 micrograms per deciliter. Most of them were general population exposures uh, with a geometric mean of 10. And what you see here, this is women and this is men, this is creatinine clearance, this is lead, this is listed in, in micrograms per liter instead of micrograms per deciliter because this is a European study. And if you can see here, like, so 33 would be 3.3, this would be 6.6, 13.2 micrograms per deciliter. There was a very strong linear relationship that as blood lead increased, uh, uh, creatinine clearance decreased. And even if you just looked at um, those who had no occupational exposure um, and you just you remove them from the study, you still saw this relationship. And this, um, this is consistent with the fact that lead could have an adverse effect on, on renal function. I think this issue is really unresolved for the fact that lead is predominantly excreted through the kidney. So the component of reverse causation, perhaps, where when you have decreased renal function, you have less lead elimination and you have a higher blood lead concentration has not been fully resolved. It's possible there's a bi-directional relationship and that they're the same, both relationships exist at the same time. But nevertheless, the data is out there and it's concerning. What about lead exposure and neurocognitive function in an occupational cohort? There have been several compelling studies that have suggested that lead exposure to adults at relatively low levels in the teens can contribute to cognitive dysfunction later in life. This particular study was conducted in Pittsburgh uh, by Cal Dr. Khalil and, and colleagues, included Dr. Herbert Needleman, many of you have heard about. And they looked at lead workers and controls who they had initially assessed in 1982 with neurocognitive function, neuropsychological tests. They went back and looked at them again, or they, looked, they recruited people from the subgroups in 2004. And the mean blood lead concentration of the workers in 1982 was 40 micrograms per deciliter. In 2004, it had fallen to 12. The control subjects in 1982 had a blood lead of 7.2, and at the time of follow-up in 2004, they had blood lead of um, three. The mean age of these workers at the time of the reassessment was about 54, plus or minus nine. And they measured not only their blood lead, but their bone lead. And they were able actually, based on assuming a half-life of bone lead uh, in tibia of 27 years, they were, be able to, they were ex back extrapolated to what the individual's bone lead would have been at their peak of end of exposure. And this is what they got, 57 and 12. Now, what they did is they related this to cognitive, the change in cognitive function over time. And what they found was about among the exposed individuals who had worked with lead, bone lead concentration was significantly uh, correlated in a negative direction with total cognitive score, score on spatial uh, reasoning and on executive function. However, in the non-exposed individuals, there was no relationship between bone lead and cognitive function. And this was after adjusting for other covariates, uh, such as age and education. Blood lead was not associated with the decline. It was the cumulative exposure. And what was interesting is that the lead-exposed workers experienced a 17% greater loss in their total cognitive function compared to the non-exposed controls. Now these were uh, workers and they were exposed at, at lead levels you know, in the 40s, but the similar findings have been found in populations with general uh, environmental levels of exposure. And this was from a subset 
of the normative aging study, again, a lot of major contributions have come from that, where they had men who had two sets of neurocognitive uh, functioning tests over a 3.5 year interval. The mean, median blood lead was relatively low, five micrograms per deciliter, and they looked at bone lead as a predictor of decline in cognitive function. And what they found was, as a function of your bone lead, there was a change in an individual's visual spatial performance. And here, in this particular test, I'm showing you the response latency on uh, pattern recognition. So in other words, the greater your latency, it means the slower you are to respond. And you see, as your bone lead level went up, it took you longer to respond. This is a subtle marker, but nevertheless, it's a marker that individuals with higher bone lead later in life had a greater decline in cognitive function. Dr. Hu and his colleagues did an interesting thing using a relatively new technology called proton magnetic resonance. And proton magnetic resonance is predominantly a re research tool now, but you're able to actually hone in on a small section of the brain using uh, advanced spectroscopy and measure various com chemical components of the brain. So here, for example, using this is a coronal image. They were able to take this area, I believe it was in the temporal area of the brain, temporal lobe area, and they were able to measure various different chemical constituents. Um, this one here is N-acetyl aspartase. This is myelin -ostatol. Various different chemicals that are present in the brain. And they related that to the individual's bone lead measurements. These were people who were members of that normative aging study. They weren't people who were demented. They were, they were, they were functioning individuals. And what, what they found was as you looked at increased bone lead measurements, you saw an increase rate, uh, increased concentration of myelin -ostatol. Now, myelin -ostatol is a component of glial cells like astrocytes, and it's thought that this is a, a measure of glial proliferation and plaque formation, which is present in uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So this is perhaps a correlate to possibly uh, explain why we're seeing these, uh, this decline in cognitive function in, in, uh, the, in the elderly population as a consequence of lead exposure. This is another study that was conducted in Baltimore by uh, Dr. Shi and uh, colleagues in which they took just randomly selected individuals who lived in uh, the Baltimore area. Their mean blood lead was 3.5, and they too found that bone lead concentration was associated with decrease in visual construction skills on neuropsychological testing. And they showed that a 13 part per million increase in bone lead, which was the interquartile range between 25 to 75 percent, was associated with the same as five, almost five years extra years of aging. Now, I want you to think about something. When you're talking about an elder, an aging population, and you're talking about five more years of brain age or brain function, or, you know, gaining five more years of brain function by not having this exposure or losing it, that's very significant. You know, as we approach the late 70s in our country, we have about 25% of people with some element of dementia. If you can uh, save people five years of, uh, of cognitive age, or the effects of five years of aging in that old age, that's a significant public health impact. Let's turn finally to some issues about lead and reproductive issues. And why is this important for the workplace? Well, we have women of work reproductive age uh, as members of the workforce who are exposed to lead, and this may actually increase as time goes on. And a very interesting study and a very well-done study that was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology looked prospectively at the risk of uh, lead exposure and spontaneous abortion. These were women in Mexico City who were just appearing for routine prenatal care. They, measured, they took a blood lead measurement at the time that they enrolled, and then they looked and followed these people throughout their pregnancy every week to see who uh, had a spontaneous abortion or not. And this is what they found in terms of um, the odds ratio of having a spontaneous abortion. Comparing the baseline group of those who had a blood lead less than five, those who had a blood lead of 
nine had more than double the risk of a spontaneous abortion. And those 10 to, 10 to 14, five-fold risk. This higher group, and there weren't many in that, had a 12.2-fold <laughs> increased risk. Very substantial increases associated with uh, blood lead. And again, these are not lead workers. These are, these are women in, uh, in Mexico City who uh, have higher blood lead at average age of enrollment because of the prior history of a lot of air pollution from leaded gasoline and smelters in the Valley of Mexico. This study was also performed in Mexico City um, where they looked at the bone lead of the mothers and they looked at the relationship to the birth weight of their infants. The average maternal age, uh, I mean maternal bone le uh, blood lead in this cohort of 272 women was 8.9 and their maternal bone lead levels uh, were average of 9.8 with a range of 12 to 38. And in a multivariable regression model, every uh, 10 micrograms per gram increase in maternal bone lead was associated with a, with a 73 gram decrement in birth weight. And the relationship was nonlinear and it was most significant in those in the higher quartile of bone lead, where the decrease in, uh, in bone lead, uh, excuse me, in birth weight was 156 grams. And I want to share with you one of the conclusions that the authors said. And they pointed out that lead stays in bone for quite a long time. So because of that, because lead remains in, in bone for years to decades, mobilization of bone lead during pregnancy may pose a significant fetal exposure with health consequences long after maternal external lead exposure has declined. So if a woman is working in the lead trades and is exposed to lead for 10, 15 years, then stops and then decides she's going to. Or, or 10 years, let's say, and then decide she's going to become pregnant. Uh, even if she's off of work and her blood lead has come down, the long-term lead that's stored in the bones can be mobilized during the calcium mobilization that occurs and remodeling that occurs during pregnancy and still have an impact even after she's left the workplace. <coughs> Not only do we see changes in the growth of the baby's uh, interuterine and their birth weight, but we also have seen effects on head circumference. This is another study conducted in a uh, longitudinal uh, study of women in Mexico City, and they um, looked at the um, blood lead concentration of the mothers at 36 weeks and the head circumference of the infants at six months of age. And you can see this is a log scale, but as the Blood lead concentration of the mothers during gestation increased, the head circumference went down. Now, if you see lead having an adverse effect on birth weight, and if you see it having an adverse effect on the size of head circumference, you would expect, perhaps, that it would have an adverse effect on the cognitive function of the children. And that's exactly what they show. This is a study by uh, Lourdes Schnass and her colleagues, and uh, Dr. Rothenberg was also part of this uh, study, and this looked at um, the third trimester blood lead in a prospective study of women who were being, who became pregnant and then their offspring were filed. In utero, their mothers had a, a third trimester blood lead on average of 7.8. And then they measured their IQ of these children when they were 6 to 10 years of age. And they controlled for other variables, you know, such as um, the mother's IQ, uh, the, 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 the birth weight, the socioeconomic status. After controlling for those other factors, you see as the mother's blood lead went up, the IQ of the children went down. And it went down in an, actually in a, in a, in a nonlinear pattern. It was even greater effect at lower lead levels. This is interesting because they've done prospective studies of of uh, young of children in school, and they've seen a, a nonlinear or superlinear dose response between blood lead and cognitive function. But here, this should, the reason I'm talking about the prenatal exposure is because this is the kind of exposure a woman could have when she's in the workplace. Well, taking all these issues together, we. A group of us published a paper 
that appear in environmental health perspectives in March of 2007, in which we made recommendations for the management of adult lead exposure. And we basically said that for individuals who have blood leads between five or nine, we should discuss the health risks, and we particularly should take action to reduce lead exposure for women who are or may become pregnant. Oops. In blood leads between 10 to 19, we want to decrease the lead exposure. We want to increase the biological monitoring, and we want to consider removing them from exposure to avoid the long-term risks I've talked about if their blood leads don't come down, and particularly be concerned about removing them at these levels if they have already some dysfunction in various endpoints for which lead contributes, perhaps um, cardiovascular disease or hypertension or cognitive impairment. Between blood leads of 20 to 29, Remove them from exposure if a repeat blood lead measured in four weeks was greater than 20. Between 30 to 39, remove them from exposure even if a single blood level was in that range. From 40 to 79, refer them for prompt medical evaluation. And greater than 80, uh, reserve, refer them for immediate and urgent medical evaluation. So let's summarize what we've talked about in this lecture. I hope I've shown and persuaded you that occupational health standards that tolerate blood lead concentrations greater than 20 are insufficiently protective of health of workers and are outdated, that low to moderate levels of lead exposure, blood lead levels in the 10 to 20 range, in the teens, are associated with a risk of hypertension and cardiovascular disease, cognitive dysfunction later in life, adverse reproductive outcomes, and a possible decrement in renal function, and that the goal is to keep blood lead levels less than 10 long term, less than 5 in the case of women of reproductive age, and that a single blood lead over 30 or two or consecutive blood leads over 20 med merit medical removal protection. And finally, you might see that we've come about this information over a long period of time, and I'm reminded of a letter that Benjamin Franklin wrote in 1786 when he was commenting on the fact that he had observed many occupational issues in printers and in uh, people in the various trades where they were exposed to lead. And he said, you will see to it, but the opinion of this mischievous effect of lead is at least over 60 years old, and you will observe with concern how long a useful truth may be known and exist before it is generally received and practiced on. I've hoped we will practice on it quite soon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kosnev, for an excellent presentation and for doing a lot of work that all of us would have to spend many, many hours to put together. So thank you so much. Um, remember your white index cards on the left-hand side of your, uh, your portfolio uh, for questions, and the bowl is over there, so please don't forget that. Um, our next uh, presenter on the pharmacokinetic modeling of air lead and blood lead level relationship is Dr. Kathleen Vork. Dr. Vork has extensive experience and expertise relating to the pharmacokinetics of lead in the worker and general adult population. Her research has used various statistical and mathematical modeling methods to estimate, adjust, and check the accuracy and consistency of biokinetic models. Dr. Vork is currently a research scientist in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment at the Environmental Protection Agency in California. She received her PhD degree, PhD degree in Environmental Health Sciences from the University of California at Berkeley and her MPH degree in Occupational and Environmental Health from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Her dissertation work had focused on lead exposure during construction work. Please uh, welcome uh, Kathleen. <laughs> 
thank you, Dr. Howard, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you very much, um, Dr. Kosnett, for a very compelling uh, story on uh, the science of um, the health effects of lead. And thank you, all of you, for the opportunity to present OEHA's work involving the est uh, in estimating a workplace exposure and worker blood lead concentrations using an updated physiologically based pharmacokinetic or PBBK model. So before I begin, um, I'd like to go over the major topics that I'll be covering. First, I will cover a bit of the background about the project that OEHA was asked to do and um, its purpose. Then I'll explain the modeling task that we were asked to do. And after that, I will give an, uh, uh, an overview of the process involved in selecting, updating, and testing the model. And finally, I will show you some of the results of our modeling work. So we just heard from Dr. Kosnett about the new evidence of the adverse and compelling evidence of the adverse health effects of, of um, blood lead levels that are much lower than the limits set by the current OSHA st standard. In order to, to address this new evidence, the California Department of Public Health, or CDPH, is making recommendations to Cal OSHA to change the current workplace standard for lead to one that is more protective of worker health. As part of that effort, estimates of workplace air concentrations of lead that result in a range of blood lead levels are needed. These estimates were originally established back in the 1970s with the help of a predictive model. So CDPH turned to OEHA to do the bottling work. So the Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program at the Department of Public Health initiated a memorandum of understanding with OEHA to perform two tasks relative to chronic workplace exposure conditions. The first task is to calculate air concentrations of lead that correspond to the blood levels in workers, and the second task is to estimate the time it takes for high blood lead levels to return to a much lower blood lead level after removal from exposure to lead in the workplace. So CDPH needed to characterize the air of blood lead relationship over a working lifetime at relatively low blood lead levels. Although there is a growing body of literature showing the air-blood relationship among uh, worker groups. We could not find a study um, of exposures over working lifetime in the open literature. So OEHA used a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model to do this characteriz characterization. So. Um, why do we need a um, PBBK model? Well, there's several complex issues involved in how the body handles lead. Um, there are two absorption pathways with very different characteristics of absorption, and lead distributes all over the body. And the uptake, storage, and release from different tissues varies greatly from weeks to months to decades, as Dr. Kosnett had pointed out. In addition, there are two major elimination pathways. Under these circumstances, a PVPK model is needed to cope with these multiple issues. So before I go on to the modeling work we did, I'm going to take a just a few minutes to explain what a PVPK model is in general and then give you an example of how a lead model copes and needs to cope with two complex issues. So a physiologically based pharmacokinetic 
kinetic model is a mathematical model that represents the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of a substance in the human body. Models are made up of multiple compartments that correspond to the organs and tissues in the body with connections between compartments via the blood. Mathematical equations represent the concentration of the substance in the compartment and movement between compartments. The equations are often derived from experimental studies on humans and animals. Some models are quite straightforward. However, in the case of lead, the model needs to be complex. The air and blood lead relationship, for example, changes with exposure history and the buildup of lead in, in blood. So here's a general diagram of a model for lead. In this model, lead enters through two pathways. Once in the blood, much of the lead binds to red blood cells and some remains unbound in the plasma, free to distribute throughout the body. As the amount of lead in blood increases, several studies show that the red blood cells take up less and less lead and at very high levels become saturated. As um, red blood cells take up less and less lead, the unbound lead in plasma rises and that increases the amount of lead that distributes to soft tissue and bone or eliminates or that is eliminated through the urine pathway. In, in addition, over time, the amount of lead in bone accumulates and the amount that releases from bone back to blood Um, also increases, as illustrated by the fatter, fatter red arrows pointing back to the blood. These changes in how the body distributes and eliminates this metal has led to a rich accumulation of models. So now I will um, go into the steps involved in the overall project that we um, were asked to do. So here is a flow diagram. Uh, of the steps involved with um, our overall project. First, we reviewed and selected an existing model. And second, we tested the model. I'm just going to go down the, the flow diagram here. Um, second, we tested the model with worker data. Third, we adjusted the ret and retested the model. Fourth, we added the features to um, adapt the model to workplace exposure scenarios. And fifth, we tested the adapted model and used it to complete the two tasks we were asked to do. So in the next section of this presentation, I will briefly, briefly summarize each step. And finally, I'll show you some results for uh, tasks one and two from the adjusted model we call Legit Plus. So we started by reviewing the literature and selected the best pub published model for our purposes. We chose the model design and tested by Dr. Richard Leggett, who um, published his model in 1993. Um, there's a tradition of naming models after the people who designed them. So the one designed and tested by Dr. Leggett is referred to as the Leggett model. Um, and it's referred to oftentimes in the, in the peer-reviewed literature discussing models. Although there are many lead models that have been validated, peer-reviewed, and published, we chose the Leggett model because it handled changes in exposure history and c copes with complex issues of red blood cell saturation and the accumulation and release of lead in the skeleton. And um, it has a modular structure. So um, here's a schematic diagram of Dr. Leggett's model showing flows in and out of multiple compartments, with blood being the central compartment. So, and here are boxes on the right that represent separate lung, 
separate lung and gastrointestinal tract models illustrating the modular design of this overall model. Leggett refers, offers both a simple and more com complicated lung model in his publication. So the first thing we did was to test predictions of blood lead levels from the core Leggett model with worker data, the core model being what the model does after lead enters the blood. So we searched the literature for individual measurements of blood lead levels over time and settled on the ASARCO data set. This is, a da this is data from a cohort of smelter workers made available in the report to federal OSHA by Dr. Dale Haddis in 1981. This rich data set provided blood lead measurements and employment histories on a large number of workers. Blood lead levels obtained before employment offered an estimate of background non-workplace exposure. Blood lead levels taken after a long history of exposure and just before a labor strike, along with level, levels taking, taken after returning from that nine month strike, offered a way of checking how accurately the model characterizes elimination from lead from the skeleton. We concluded that this cohort provided the best data available to represent workers chronically exposed to lead. I'm smiling at Dr. Haddis sitting in the audience here. <laughs> um, so here, here is a graph that compares measured and predicted blood post-strike blood lead levels. Measured blood lead levels are on the horizontal axis and predicted blood lead levels are on the vertical axis. The line going through the, through the data points represent a one-to-one -one relationship or zero difference between the measured and predicted blood lead levels. Now, zero difference on average would indicate no systematic bias in predicting post-strike blood lead levels for this worker cohort. But here you can see that most measured blood lead levels are greater than predicted blood lead levels. And in fact, uh, the mean difference for the cohort was four micrograms per deciliter, indicating that the model systematically underpredicted blood lead levels by that much. We were initially pretty satisfied with that model, um, that the model predicted post-strike blood lead levels close to those measured in the worker cohort. However, some of our external reviewers <laughs> viewed this as unacceptable bias. So the next step was to find and adjust key parameters in the model and retest the adjusted model with the same smelter cohort data. Okay, so in our review of studies that examined and um, adjusted the Leggett and other lead models, we found that parameters related to the four um, parts of the model listed here are candidates for adjusting the model and reducing the systematic under prediction of blood levels in the um, ASARCO cohort. Since our adjustments involved multiple parameters relating um, to lead and plasma, urine and blood, we also needed to check how well predictions of lead in these and other compartments fit measurements of lead in these fluids and body tissues in the body. Hence, in addition to the ASARCO data set, we extracted data from several additional studies of chronically exposed lead workers. To check the effect of model adjustments on predictions of lead in bone, we compared model predictions to measurements of lead um, in bone by X that was measured by X-ray fluorescence, as mentioned by technique that was mentioned by um, Dr. Kosnett, from a group of workers chronically exposed to lead in, the, um, in a Canadian smelter, at a Canadian smelter, and 
um, bone lead data from autopsy studies of the general population. So to check the effect of model adjustments on predictions of lead in red blood cells, urine, and other body tissues, we compared model predictions to measurements of lead in plasma and urine relative to blood lead taken from chronically exposed workers in these studies listed here, as well as lead in body tissues from autopsy studies in the general population. By satisfying the five tests that are listed here, we were convinced that the, bod that the model could accurately and, rel and reliably predict blood lead levels after chronic ex workplace exposure and along with a, an adapted workplace exposure model would be able to complete the two tasks specified in the um, MOU. So before I show you the results of the tests we performed, I want to show you uh, the final values of our key parameters of the Leggett model relative to those in the original Leggett model that are shown in the second column and those established through a study um, by Nyan colleagues shown in the fourth column. So um, we ran hundreds of model performance tests before arriving at our final set of parameter values, which fell between those published by the original um, in the original model by Leggett and later by Nye. In addition, we lowered the red blood cell concentration of lead at which binding capacity saturate, saturates, shown here in this um, second to last row of the table. This value is based on a study of red blood cell saturation in non-human primates published by um, Ellen O'Flaherty. We also removed the assumed threshold established by Leggett um, in his original model. Okay, here is the graph of red blood uh, of um, blood lead levels among the Asarco workers measured after returning from a nine-month strike versus post-strike blood lead levels predicted from the adjusted. Leggett model. And these data are evenly sc scattered about the one-to-one -one relationship. And recall that the original test of measured versus predicted post-strike blood lead levels indicated that the model systematically underpredicted on average blood lead levels by four micrograms per deciliter. Well, this graph shows a much better fit and a mean difference between measured and predicted blood lead levels of slightly less than one microgram per deciliter, indicating improved performance from the adjusted model. In addition, we saw no statistically significant evidence as indicated by a p-value greater than um, 0.05 that the model performed differently relative to how long workers were exposed indicating that uptake and release of lead from bone was about right in the adjusted model. So next, we ran an exposure scenario for one retired smelter worker from the Canadian data set um, published by Nye and colleagues um, to show how the adjusted model predicts lead in two different types of bone and in whole blood over time. In, so in this graph, the purple line represents lead predicted in trabecular bone, and the blue line represents lead predicted in cortical bone. The red line represents lead in whole blood. In the NICE study, lead was measured by X-ray fluorescence technique in bone sites represented 
representing each bone type. And the blue stars in this graph represent the average of several measurements taken on one smelter worker four years after retirement. In the um, entire cohort, the range of lead measured in trabecular bone um, in the subjects of the Nye study, the ratio between the trabecular and the um, cortical bone uh, fell between, uh, trabecular bone was about two to three times those measured, the uh, lead leveled in, uh, lead level measured in cortical bone on a mass per mass basis, which is similar to what um, is modeled by the adjusted Leggett model. So uh, next we needed to check the predictions of lead in other body tissues and fluids from, um, with the predictions from the adjusted model. Um, so here's a brief, br some brief summaries of the data that we used to check the adjusted model. Manton, and I'll just briefly mention their characteristics. Manton and Cook reported lead levels in serum and whole blood obtained from patients of a medical practice. Lee reported summary estimates of lead in urine and whole blood from chronically exposed battery factory workers. And Harada and colleagues reported multiple sets of blood and urine lead taken from four chronically exposed workers from a specialty paint factory in Korea. So this graph shows how lead levels in plasma or serum shown on the vertical axis increase relative to levels of lead in whole blood shown on the horizontal axis. The red squares represent the data from the Harada study. The blue diamonds represent the data from the Manson and Cook study. And the teal triangles represent the predicted levels of lead in plasma relative to whole blood from the adjusted Leggett model. Note that the predictions fell within the data from these two studies. Okay. Um, so here's, here the graph on the left shows how lead levels in urine, again shown in the ver on the vertical axis, increase relative to levels of lead in whole blood shown on the horizontal axis. Now the blue squ squares represent the mean and one standard deviation as reported in the Lee study. On the right, the blue diamonds represent the data from the Harada study, whereas the teal triangles represent predicted levels of lead in urine relative to whole blood from the adjusted Leggett model. So finally, we examined how well the adjusted Leggett model distri uh, distributed lead across body tissues by comparing the percent of lead predicted to be in body compartments to lead in tissue groups um, reported in autopsy studies. Dr. Leggett tested the, his original model with autopsy data by combining data from several autopsy studies and deriving uncertainty bounds. We repeated this comparison with, predict with predictions from the adjusted Leggett model. So here are two bar graphs showing estimated lower and upper bound estimates of the proportion of lead body burden that resides in six tissue groups. The bar graph on the left represents estimates from autopsy studies of people in their 20s and 30s, and the bar graph on the right rep represents estimates of autopsy studies of people in their 40s and 50s. Now the darkest bar in each graph represents predictions from the uh, adjusted Leggett model, and the next two bars, 
to the right of that darker bar represent the lower and upper bound estimates from the Leggett uncertainty analysis of autopsy data. And note that the predictions stayed within the limits of uncertainty. So first of all, the test based on the ASARCO data provided convincing evidence that the adjusted Leggett model accurately and reliably predict the levels of lead in blood after an extended time away from workplace exposure. Also tests based on the, the data from factory workers, smelters, patients, and post-mortem studies provided convincing evidence that the adjusted Leggett model accurately predicted the level of lead in other body tissues. Once we were convinced that these tests, by these tests, that we felt, um, we felt that we could move on to the next step, which was to add exposure features to the model. So now I'm going to describe how we incorporated each of the, ex the workplace exposure factors listed here into the exposure model. So first, we examined the literature on activity-based breathing rates. Two major studies, one reported um, by US EPA in the, in the 2009 um, Exposure Factors Handbook, and the other by the um, International Commission of Radiologic Protection, or ICRP. Uh, which, and the two of them differed somewhat in how they uh, uh, labeled, I guess, uh, the breathing rates associated with certain activities. So, for example, breathing rates associated with light activity in the ICRP analysis were similar to those reported for moderate activity in the US EPA Exposure Factor Handbook. However, we selected breathing rates associated with activity levels reported by the US EPA and assumed that more than half of the workers um, in a 24-hour day spent resting or performing light work and less than half performing moderate level activities with a resulting breathing rate of 26 meters cubed per day per workers. Next, we examined how workplace air lead once inhaled transfers to blood. The next several slides address how we determined the best inhalation transfer coefficient values to use. To start with, the amount of lead transferred depends on several factors, including the, the size distribution of lead particles in workplace air, wherein the wear in the <coughs> respiratory tract particles deposit and how they are cleared. So, we extracted information from studies that characterized the, the size distribution of lead particles in several workplaces and operations. We selected three. The Park and Pick reported study reported size distributions of lead particles from several industries listed here. And the Lou study um, reported similar um, operations or uh, industries, but in addition, also reported the size distribution of particles in um, the, a brass foundry. And Spear reported data on uh, four lead compounds. So these. Um, Lead of lead particles. And so these studies provided a broad range of information about um, lead particles in the workplace. 
So we derived an inhalation transfer coefficient from an analysis of lead deposition in the respiratory tract using a model called the multipath particular dose, uh, part, particle dosimetry, or MPPD, MPPD version 2. This recently developed model predicts the fraction of lead deposited in the, in the head and lung regions based on particle size, breathing rate, and other parameters. Using the output of the model, combined with other generally accepted information about how the respiratory tract handles particulate matter, we, esta um, we established an equation that's highlighted here for the inhalation transfer coefficient, or ITC, at the bottom of the diagram. This equation says that the transfer of the inhaled lead in, is equal to the percent deposited in the alveolar region of the lung or the deep lung times the percent absorbed by the, to the blood plus the percent deposited in the head or upper airway region of the respiratory tract, which is the ciliated region, region times the percent absorbed to the blood. So here's an example of output from the MPPD2 model showing the range of percent lead deposited in the total respiratory system and broken down by the percent deposited in the ciliated and head region and the alveoli or the deep lung. Particle size information of mostly small, smaller, I'm sorry, Particle size and information and results from the um, deposition analysis for resting and heavy activities appear in column two for radiator repair workers who um, had mostly small particles in the workplace, measured mostly s s smaller particles in the workplace, and column three for battery workers exposed to mostly higher, um, larger particles relative to the radiator workers. And notice that this substantial proportion of inhaled lead from both occupational groups is deposited in the upper airways. Okay, so it's well established that particles that deposit in the deep lung or alveoli <laughs> absorb directly to the blood and those that deposit in the upper airways and head move to the throat and are swallowed to be absorbed through the gut. Since a large proportion of the lead is deposited in the upper airways, we concluded that accounting for this under various conditions in the gut is important because um, that's where it transfers to the blood. For simplicity, we assume that the that the form of lead inhaled is highly soluble and absorbs completely from the alveoli within a day. We calculated that about 30% of the lead that is swallowed absorbs from the gut to the blood within a day. So I'll walk you through the basis of this calculation next. I have to take another drink of water. <laughs> So Leggett actually summarized the percent absorbed in the gut from several mass balance studies. And so we took the midpoint of the percent of a, um, of a the mid pent, the midpoint of the percent absorbed, um, which is found here on the slide um, in black type and the range of lead absorbed to the blood under um, three different conditions in the gut are shown in blue type. On the right are the time weightings and midpoints that we used. We had assumed that during most of the day, the gut is empty or contains only liquid 
and hence about 30% of the lead moved from the respiratory system to the gut absorbs to the blood over 24 hours. Then based on the percent absorbed from the deep lung and um, from the gut to the blood, the fraction of lead deposited in the deep lung in the ciliated and head region of the respiratory tract, we calculated an inhalation transfer coefficient. <clears throat> so, in this, so in the example at the top of the slide, we calculated ITCs based on activity during the, the workday. And in this example, workers inhaled lead particles from battery manufacturing engaged in heavy activity transferred 30% of the lead deposited in the respiratory system. We also calculated um, ITCs based on a time weighting of activity levels during the workday for several occupational settings, which all tended to be around 30%. So we were convinced that 30% of the lead deposited in the respiratory tract transfers to the blood. So a default breathing rate of 26 meters cubed per day, an ITC, inhalation transfer coefficient of 30%, a default fraction of each day that a worker is exposed per, over a year, and the measured personal breathing zone concentration of lead makes up the ex makes up the model adapted to workplace conditions so the next step involved combining uh, the adapted exposure model with the adjusted core model now called Leggett plus and testing it with data from studies that reported air and blood lead, level, blood lead levels at the individual subject level. So this diagram illustrates the final testing process. We selected two studies that collected both air and blood lead, blood lead information for each study subject. We used the information from these studies as inputs to the model and compared predictions of blood lead from Leggett Plus to blood lead levels observed in study subjects. So the first study conducted by Williams and colleagues in the 1960s um, on air and blood lead, uh, collected air and blood lead data from battery uh, plant workers in order to model worker exposure, however, we had to make some assumptions about exposure from sources of lead other than the workplace and the number of years these workers were exposed to, um, to lead in the workplace. So the data provided by Williams are listed in the first three bullets and the assumptions we applied to the model are listed in the last two bullets. So. Here's a graph comparing measured and predicted blood lead levels. On this graph, values of 16 measured blood lead levels that were at or below 60 micrograms per deciliter are on the horizontal axis, and predicted blood lead levels are on the, from the Leggett Plus model are on the vertical axis. And so as stated earlier, the line going through the data points represents a one-to-one -one relationship or zero difference between measured and predicted blood lead levels. And you can see that the measured blood lead levels are distributed above and below the line. And on average, Leggett Plus predicted blood lead levels in line with those observed by the Williams et al. study. The second study published by Griffin and colleagues in 1975, collected air and blood lead levels from volunteers exposed under controlled conditions in a chamber. The two experiments were conducted each over an average of 16 weeks. The data provided by the study are listed here. When we ran, when we ran the Leggett Plus, we adjusted the values in the exposure model, however, to reflect a 23-hour daily exposure 
over consecutive days rather than the time waiting for uh, an exposure um, in the workplace, which is five days a week and um, eight hours a day. So again, you can see that the Leggett Plus predicts blood levels on average in line with those observed um, from the Griffin study. So after all this testing, adjusting, and retesting, we are convinced that the Leggett model predicts the uptake distribution and, elim and elimination of lead after chronic workplace exposure consistently and without significant bias, establishing an air-blood-lead relationship. At this point, we could convincingly complete confidently complete the two modeling tasks CDPH asked OEHA to do. So first we provided results for the median worker, was by modeling, but then, you know, of course individuals um, differ from one another in the way their bodies handle lead. Therefore, we needed to account for the distribution of values among workers. And this required a description of the inter-individual variability. This type of variability is generally understood to be log-normally distributed and represented by a geometric standard deviation. So we were confident that the work accepted by US EPA and published by a different Griffin and colleagues in 1999 was also suit suitable for our purposes. Griffin and colleagues examined the inter-individual differences in blood levels from two large cohorts of children indep independent of levels of exposure to lead in soil. They conducted multiple statistical tests and reported median geometric standard deviations between 1.4 and 1.7. Well then, OEHA estimated the GSD of blood levels from experimental and worker cohorts as well, and concluded that the geometric mean chosen, a geometric standard deviation chosen um, by US EPA of 1.6 is representative of the inter-individual inter variability in the worker population as well. From predictions of blood lead levels for the median worker, we estimated blood lead levels associated with workers at the 95th percentile of the inter-individual distribution. So here is part of the final estimates provided by in OEHA's report for task one. The eight hour time weighted average air lead levels are in the first column, corresponding, and the corresponding blood lead levels appear in the second column. Similarly, we model the time needed to restore blood lead levels to 15 micrograms per deciliter given various exposure scenarios for the median worker. And here is part of the final estimates provided in a WeHouse report for the 95th percentile worker. So in this table, time in months appears in the center of the table in units of months. Blood lead levels just be before removal are listed in the second column, and the exposure period is listed in the first column. So when a worker who is exposed to the same job, to the same breathing zone lead concentration, reaches a blood lead level of 30 after 40 years, and is removed from the workplace <coughs> exposure, Leggett Plus predicts that the 95th percentile worker will take about 
15 months to return to a blood lead level of 15 micrograms per deciliter. So this completes the five-step process I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that took us to this point. So I want to say that my take-home message here is that a well-designed model, a synthesis of new information about the body, how the body, body handles lead, and an exposure model adapted to workplace conditions provides, uh, along, with check, uh, along with it being checked by worker and other human data, has provided CDPH with the best information for making their recommendations to Cal OSHA. Um, before I finish, I want to mention some um, precautions. Firstly, these testing efforts were limited to data from mostly adult males exposed chronically to lead. Secondly, it has not been tested for its ability to predict blood lead levels over very, very short-term exposures. And um, blood lead levels higher than, nor blood lead levels higher than 60, or um, blood lead levels in children. I want to um, acknowledge the external reviewers, Drs. Leggett, Freunds, Kosnett, Haddis, and Ginsburg, who provide extensive comments and guided this work. And finally, I want to acknowledge the co-authors and internal reviewers of the OEHA report. And a link to this report is listed at the bottom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation on very complex uh, matters, uh, the Leggett Plus model, maybe for our purposes today, we'll call it the VORC model. Uh, so thank you very much, Kathy. Um, we're going to go ahead and adjourn for lunch. Remember your white cards. And for those of you online, please send in your questions also. Uh, we're going to come back a little earlier than the schedule because we're, we're, we're lunching early. So we're scheduled to start at 1.15. We're going to start uh, about 5 after 1. Uh, so uh, again, uh, all you have to do is leave the building turn uh, left and go to uh, Shattuck Avenue. Actually, you don't even have to go that far. There's a Mexican restaurant right next door. Uh, so ask uh, if you want some more information. So we'll see you all back here at 1.05 p.m. Thank you.
All right, we're going to begin and uh, welcome back to all of you here uh, in Berkeley and welcome back to all of you uh, on the web. Thank you very much uh, again for your participation and thank you very much for the questions that you're sending in. Um, our third formal presenter on the topic of health-based permissible exposure limit recommendation by the California Department of Public Health is Dr. Barbara Materna. Barbara is the chief of the occupational health branch in the California Department of Public Health. Prior to this position, she was chief of the occupational lead poisoning prevention program at the California Department of Public Health. Barbara is a certified industrial hygienist with over 30 years of occupational health uh, experience working for the most part in state and local government public health programs. She holds a PhD in environmental health sciences from UC Berkeley. Besides occupational lead poisoning prevention, Dr. Materna's work has focused on diverse topics including wildland firefighter exposures, injuries to among refuse collectors, lung disease linked to flavoring chemicals, and respiratory protection for the prevention of aerosol transmissible diseases. Please welcome Dr. Materna. Thank you very much, Dr. Howard. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank Barbara Plogg and her staff at the CAOEH Continuing Education Program for hosting this symposium. Let's give them all a round of hand. I've been working on lead poisoning prevention for quite a long while now. Along with my colleagues, colleagues at the California Department of Public Health and many others, including many of you who are participating here today, either in the room with us or on webinars. I'm pleased to see the level of interest in this topic at this particular time. By continuing to work together, I know we can make progress toward better protection for lead-exposed workers. I'd like to start out today by reminding us of the context for holding this symposium at this particular time and by using a metaphor. You see here on the right of the photo the brand new San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, which opened this September. Next to it is the old bridge, which was an architectural wonder in its day when it opened in 1936, but it's now being demolished. The original bridge despite being constructed according to specific safety standards, failed in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, hence the need for a new bridge meeting more modern seismic standards. So it is with lead standards. The 1978 Federal OSHA General Industry lead standard was groundbreaking in its time, and it's resulted in inc increased protection for many, many workers and really pretty much the disappearance of acute lead intoxication. The construction lead standard that was developed in the early 1990s extended this, these protections to construction workers, but without considering the new information on the toxicity of lead. So now in 2013, it's widely known that the lead standards are outdated and we look forward to moving down the road toward revi revising them. Here's the roadmap for my presentation today. I'll start out with a brief introduction of the Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program and share some of our blood lead data on California workers. I'll remind you about some previous recommendations that we made to Cal OSHA for improvements in the lead standards. And finally, I'll explain the basis for CDPH's recommendation for a health-based permissible exposure limit. The Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program was established in, in the California Department of Public Health through legislation that was passed in 1991. The legislation aimed to provide a comprehensive public health program to address the documented problem of occupational lead poisoning. In this program, we work cooperatively with employers, workers, and others to make these services available statewide. 
In the past 20 plus years, we've carried out a number of significant projects designed to help specific lead industries, for example, by offering training or on-site technical assistance. We have focused, for example, on radiator repair shops, as well as construction industries, including painting, remodeling, and heavy construction. Our legislative mandates include operating a statewide registry of adult blood lead test results. We also develop in and disseminate educational materials, conduct trainings, provide technical assistance, for example, to employers and healthcare providers. We investigate when a worker becomes lead poisoned or when family members have been exposed to lead brought home from the workplace. We work with these individual employers to ensure that unsafe working conditions are corrected. Finally, we're mandated to make recommendations to prevent occupational lead poisoning, and this includes how worker protection standards can be approved. So around the year 2000, we began to build the case for updating the lead standards. We have actively reviewed the scientific and technical literature on chronic and low level exposure and toxicity of lead. We worked with NIOSH, the National Center for Environmental Health, and the Association of Occupational and Environmental Clinics to convene a panel of lead experts to consider the current science and update medical management guidelines for lead exposed workers. This work re resulted in a 2007 publication in the journal Environmental Health Perspectives, which Dr. Kosnett already mentioned, and it also served as the basis for the 2009 CDPH medical guidelines, which we distribute to healthcare providers. I'm going to share with you some current data from our blood lead registry, but first a little bit of introduction. By law, all blood lead test results in California must be reported to the California Department of Public Health. We process over 58,000 adult blood lead reports each year. Many of the reports are missing key information because either it was not submitted by the laboratory or the ordering or the doctor who ordered the test. So our staff invest a lot of time to obtain missing information, but still, for about half of the workers tested each year, we're unable to determine the industry they work in. So this limits our ability to draw conclusions about blood lead distributions by industry. Finally, the most important thing to remember is that not all employers in lead industries offer blood lead testing to their workers. Clearly, this limits what we know about the magnitude and distributions of blood leads among California workers. So how bad is the lack of testing problem for workers potentially exposed to lead? Here on this slide, we provide the results from five studies that we conducted between 1996 and 2008. For each industry listed in the left-hand column, we used multiple available data sources to define the universe of employers in California in that specific industry. And then we determined which employers were conducting blood lead testing. The resulting column on the right, the percentage of companies testing is listed here, ordered from highest to lowest. So as you can see, in some industries, such as battery manufacture, bloodlet testing is the norm. This is clearly not the case across all industries. This year, we re-examined the proportion of employers conducting bloodlet testing in these industries by using a different approach. The column on the right calculates the percentage of employers testing by comparing the number of employers with results reported to the registry versus the number of California establishments in that industry based on US Census data for 2011. The results are still in the same ballpark compared to our previous studies with the percentage of employers testing ranging from 2% up to nearly 90%. So the consequence of this problem is that for some industries, we have a much better idea 
of the true blood lead distributions than in others. Here I've highlighted three industries where only a small portion of employers perform blood lead testing. For these industries, we don't know the true distribution of workers' blood leads across the industry, just the findings for a small number of employers who do provide blood lead testing. This slide shows the blood lead distribution of California workers tested during 2012. The left-hand column shows different blood lead ranges from the lowest category of one to four micrograms per deciliter onto the top category of 50 plus. The middle column shows that over 18,000 workers were tested in 2012. For the right-hand column, we put each worker in the blood lead category that represents their highest blood lead for the year if they were tested more than once, and then calculated the percentage of workers in each blood lead category. So you can see that 82% of the workers tested had blood leads in the one to four microgram per deciliter range. However, when you look at the higher blood lead ranges, you see that there are over 3,000 California workers documented with blood leads at or above five micrograms per deciliter, and nearly 1,500 at or above 10. These are levels at which workers may suffer long-term health consequences if their exposures persist over time. In comparison, and I think Dr. Kosnett mentioned that uh, the geometric mean blood lead level in the general adult population is currently 1.2 micrograms per deciliter. And again, it's important to remember that all not, not all lead-exposed workers in California are represented in these data due to the lack of testing. This slide shows the 10 industries that tested the largest number of workers in 2012. The highlighted column in the middle shows the number of workers tested in each industry, ordered with the industry testing the most, on top. So you see that remediation services companies tested the most workers, around 1,200, followed by battery manufacturers. The right-hand column shows the number of companies providing testing in each industry. So I'll give you a moment to just scan through and check out these top 10 industries. And then here again, I'll point out the problem with lack of testing with an example. In the painting industry, note that 60 employers tested a total of 549 workers in 2012. For comparison, according to the US Census data, there are over 22,000 employers in this industry in California, and 38, uh, excuse me, 22,000 employees in this industry in California, and 3,800 employers. We understand that not every single worker in this industry is potentially exposed to lead. However, it's clear that this industry and others are not adequately represented in our blood lead registry. Looking at the same table, if you focus on the highlighted column on the left, you can see the percentage of workers with elevated blood leads defined as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher for each industry. Based on these data, there are some industries where we find a much lower percentage of workers with elevated blood leads than in other industries. So I'll give you a moment to scan through that column. They really range. A low percentage of elevated blood leads may be due to a number of different reasons. For example, the industry might have low airborne exposures, and so exposure control is easier. Or the industry may have significant airborne exposures, and employers do a great job of controlling exposure. Or blood lead testing is not widespread in the industry, and we're only seeing the results for those employers who both provide blood lead tests and are effectively protecting their workers. <laughs> 
This is a new slide. This slide shows the top 10 industries where the highest percentage of workers had elevated blood leads, again defined as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher. And here in this slide, we chose to include only the more significant industries in terms of uh, the amount of blood lead testing, those that tested 30 employees during the year or more. So this table is sorted by the percentage of workers with elevated blood leads, uh, ranging from 80% for firing ranges at the top, down on down to 17% for plumbing, heating, and air, con air conditioning contractors. If you're curious about blood lead distributions in other industries, uh, we have data on blood lead distributions for all industries in a report that's on our website and represents the years 2008 to 2011. So what are our conclusions about blood lead testing? First and foremost, employer testing is the best way for our program to identify high-risk industries for our targeted prevention work. However, we only have a partial picture of both the magnitude and distribution of blood leads in California due to lack of testing among lead exposed workers and missing information on laboratory reports. Finally, even without having a complete picture, we're able to see that some industries and some individual employers do keep their blood leads, their employees' blood leads low, while others may need assistance or increased motivation to reduce their exposures. In June 2010, CDPH provided recommendations to CalOSHA for improving the lead standards. We proposed revisions for many aspects of the standards, but our four core recommendations are listed here. First, the medical removal protection level, again, as, as was mentioned by Dr. Kosnett earlier, uh, that is the blood lead that causes workers to be temporarily removed from their jobs due to excessive exposures, needs to be lowered. Secondly, we recommended increasing the required frequency of blood lead testing. This will help employers assess if workplace controls are adequately protecting against both inhalation and ingestion exposure. We also recommended eliminating routine zinc protoporphyrin testing um, because it is not helpful at lower blood leads. We would also like to see blood lead testing required in all lead workplaces, independent of the air monitoring results. This would help to identify situations with significant ingestion exposure, even where air lead levels are low. And it could also cause more employers to test, even if they don't do air monitoring. Finally, we stated that the permissible exposure limit for lead needed to be lowered, but our specific recommendation was pending completion of the OEHA modeling work. The health effects literature summarized earlier today by Dr. Kosnett, along with the result of OEHA's modeling of the air lead blood lead relationship, provide the scientific basis for the CDPH health-based permissible exposure limit recommendation. I'll present it briefly here and then use the rest of my presentation to further explain how we arrived at this recommendation. We have concluded that blood leads in the range of 5 to 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher pose a health risk to workers if they continue over a working lifetime. This concern is strongly supported by the science, including the 2007 Environmental Health Perspectives monograph on lead and two reports issued by the National Toxicology Program and the US EPA in 2012 and 2013. To prevent blood leads in the 5 to 10 micrograms per deciliter range, we have determined that air lead concentrations must, must not exceed an 8-hour time-weighted average of 0.5 to 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter. I'll explain in a moment a little bit more about why we provided a range rather than a single number for a recommended PEL. At a PEL of 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter, 95% of the workers would maintain their blood leads less than 5. 
At a PEL of 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter, 95% of the workers would stay under 10. And because of the distribution of workers, 57% would stay under 5. We recognize that Cal OSHA must consider both technological and ec economic feasibility in their development of a PEL. Our recommendation for a health-based PEL is based on the best available science, and the future rulemaking process will consider these other aspects. Let's go back for a minute and consider how federal OSHA developed its PEL in for lead in 1978. FedOSHA used a pharmacokinetic model that was available in the 1970s. However, since then, newer models have been developed based on the information on the pharmacokinetics of lead, and also new approaches have been developed for modeling particle deposition in the respiratory tract. The record for the PEL development for the FedOSHA standard concluded that PEL development must consider how to prevent early and subclinical effects, how to protect workers over a working lifetime, and how to protect susceptible individuals. And by susceptible, we mean individuals who are more like to, likely to be harmed by lead exposure, for example, due to a pre-existing medical condition such as hypertension. When reviewing the extensive scientific literature on lead, and its chronic low-level health effects, there's widespread agreement that there is no known threshold below which there is no risk of adverse health effects. And as more research is conducted, especially as it becomes possible to study people who lived in an era where body burdens of lead are lower than in the past, that research continues to show effects at lower and lower exposure levels. So it's important to remember that the recommendations that we make today may also become outdated. Still, it's important to act on the information that we have now. I'm going to go through briefly the, the key definitive findings from the three main sources used by CDPH in drawing our conclusions about the health effects of chronic low-level lead exposure. I'll just touch on them very briefly. You've heard about a lot of the studies uh, rather than duplicate um, any of what was already presented. So the authors of the 2007 Environmental Health Perspectives article concluded that bloodlets that persist at levels as low as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher increase the risk of hypertension, kidney dysfunction, and reduced birth weight. The second source considered by CDPH was the National Toxicology Program's monograph, Health Effects of Low-Level Lead, that was released in 2012. In this work, NTP was looking for evidence of effects in populations with blood lead ranges as low as under 10 and under 5 micrograms per deciliter. NTP did acknowledge that these groups that were studied likely had higher blood leads earlier in their lives. This report concluded that there was sufficient evidence of an association between lead and increased blood pressure and risk of hypertension based on epidemiological studies of humans with blood leads less than 10. In addition, for blood leads under 10, NTP found a significant association for increased risk of essential tumor, which, uh, tremor, sorry, um, which is a, a neurological effect. In addition, based on studies of people that had blood leads less than five, NTP found sufficient evidence of a decreased kidney filtration rate and reduced fetal growth. The third source considered by CDPH uh, was US EPA's 2013 report on lead health effects. This effort examined the scientific evidence for effects at levels experienced by the general population due to lead pollutant exposure. 
but EPA did not link their conclu conclusions to specific blood lead level ranges. US EPA determined that there is a causal relationship between low level lead exposure and hypertension, coronary heart disease, and male reproductive effects. EPA determined that there was a likely causal relationship with decreased cognitive function and psychopathological effects. We know that the health effects found in adults studied today <clears throat> may have been influenced by higher blood leads that they experienced earlier in life. So this limits us from drawing definitive conclusions about the risk of health effects in adults with, whose blood leads have never exceeded 10 micrograms per deciliter. However, the strongest evidence exists and allows us to say with confidence that low-level lead exposure increases blood pressure and hypertension and, and the risk of hypertension and also other cardiovascular effects. There are multiple, as you've heard this morning, multiple high-quality studies that show these effects in adults with chronic blood leads as low as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher. In addition, we're concerned about the neurological effects at these levels, such as decreased cognitive function later in life. The epidemiological findings are strong, and they are supported by toxicological data. The tox findings demonstrate the similar effects in animals, and they identify plausible mechanisms of action for these effects. So we have concluded that a revised permissible exposure limit that keeps blood leads under 10 over a working lifetime will greatly decrease the risk of adverse cardiovascular and neurological effects in workers. However, since these effects appear in populations with blood leads as low as 10 and higher, this would not provide a margin of safety for the more susceptible workers. Therefore, we point out that a more protective, a more health protective PEL would keep blood leads under five micrograms per deciliter. And so we've provided a recommendation for a PEL at this other end of the range for it to meet both targeted blood lead goals. The sources of health data I cited earlier evaluated lead's health effects on male reproduction and identified concerns including effects on semen and sperm quality, fertility, and time to pregnancy. However, the male reproductive effects have been observed at slightly higher blood lead level ranges compared to other health endpoints. Therefore, keeping workers' blood leads under five, to five or 10 micrograms per deciliter should be expected to provide protection for male reproductive health. Among female workers, we're concerned about the risk of decreased fetal growth noted by NTP at blood leads under five. In addition, we know that blood leads under five in children have been associated with multiple nervous system effects. And so this evidence justifies keeping women's blood leads well under five micrograms per deciliter during pregnancy. Therefore, our recommended PEL range is not sufficient to protect pregnant workers. However, the existing medical removal provisions of the standards can be used to provide for temporary protection that a pregnant woman or a woman planning a pregnancy would need. We recommend that the, that new language be added to the standard to explicitly state that MRP benefits would apply in such cases. So for a quick recap, the principal task that CDPH requested of OEHA was to estimate the workplace air lead concentration that we re would result in blood leads of 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30 micrograms per deciliter if inhaled by workers over a 40-year working lifetime. Our goal was to use these results to our, inform our recommendation for a health-based PEL. So this table, which Dr. Vork presented earlier, shows the estimates that were produced by OEHA. It's excerpted from the full table uh, in the OEHA report, which goes up to even higher blood lead levels. <clears throat> 
On the left is the eight-hour time-weighted average workplace air lead level that would produce the corresponding blood lead shown at the right for the 95th percentile worker after 40 years of a worker working lifetime. At the 95th percentile, 95% of workers' blood leads would be expected to be less than the blood lead shown in the right-hand column. Our health-based PEL recommendation for an eight-hour time-weighted average air lead level is provided as a range, shown here with a highlighting. Uh, a PEL of 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter, which would keep 95% of workers' blood leads under 10, or a more protective PEL of 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter, which would keep 95% of workers' blood leads under 5 and provide somewhat of a margin of safety, since there is conclusive evidence of health effects with chronic blood lead starting at 10 and higher. I'd like to discuss this figure, which is also from the OEHA report. This shows graphically the modeled rise in blood lead level of the 95th percentile worker who gradually, re who gradually reaches a blood lead limit of 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30, and so on. Um, over the 40-year working lifetime. The x-axis shows exposure time in years. The y-axis shows the blood lead level of the 95th percentile worker. Um, and five different exposure scenarios are shown. Um, if you start by focusing on the bottom, I don't know where, on the bottom corner, down here, um, you can see how the, ex the exposure scenario goes. For the first two years, the worker only receives background lead exposure. Then at year two, exposure to the airborne lead levels uh, starts. And this bottom line, the blue line, shows an air lead level of 0 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter. These numbers are taken from the table you saw a minute ago. So the blood lead increases, hits a a, bl a blood lead of five, the limit blood le level at that air lead level, and so on. 2.1, here's the exposure, and the blood lead goes up and continues. Notice that the blood leads climb rapidly during the first year of ongoing workplace exposure, then somewhat slower during the next couple of years, and then much at a much slower rate uh, for the remaining exposure time. So, and while the blood lead might not be increasing substantially during these subsequent years, there will be a significant increase in bone lead that's occurring. And then this lead in the bone can continuously be released back out into the blood over the worker's lifetime. So my point here is that a worker may be at risk of chronic health effects from lead without having 40 years of exposure, continuous exposure at the air lead level that we recommend for a PEL. For example, a worker who quickly reached a blood lead of 10 or 15 and then works five to 10 more years still has quite a significant chronic exposure at the, those levels that we would be concerned about. So to conclude, the lead standards, now over 30 years old, are based on outdated information on lead toxicity. The medical removal protection levels, other key provisions, and the PEL must be revised in order to adequately protect lead-exposed workers. The CDPH health-based PEL recommendation is based on the current health effects literature on lead and on OEHA's modeling of the air lead blood lead relationship. Our recommendation is for an eight-hour time-weighted average of 0.5 to 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter, which would provide protection for the 95th percentile worker from blood leads greater than 5 or 10, respectively. This slide shows the key references um, that I've referred to. They're all available on our website. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the exceptional, exceptional staff of the Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program who contributed to the work shown in this presentation that I get to do up here. Uh, and to close, I look forward to our discussion period this afternoon. 
and to continuing to work with Kalosha and all other interested stakeholders as we move on down the road towards revising the lead standards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara, for that excellent and clarifying uh, presentation. Um, now we're going to turn to uh, our four discussants in order uh, who are going to react uh, to the three, the trilogy of presentations that we heard this morning. And it's my great pleasure to uh, start us off uh, with our first discussant, Dr. Philip Landrigan, who is the Dean for Global Health and Ethel H. Wise Professor and Chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Dr. Landrigan is a pediatrician and epidemiologist, a professor of pediatrics, and the director of Mount Sinai's Children's Environmental Health Center. Dr. Landrigan graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1967, completed an internship in medicine and pediatrics at the Cleveland Metropolitan General Hospital and a residency in pediatrics at the Children's Hospital in Boston. He also received a master's degree in occupational health and diploma of industrial health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine at the University of London. 1987, Dr. Landrigan was elected a member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Landrigan is known for his many decades of work in protecting children against the environmental threats to health, most notably for lead and pesticides. His pioneering research on lead toxicity at low levels persuaded the U.S. government to mandate removal of lead from gasoline and paint, actions that have produced a 90% decline in the incidence of childhood lead poisoning over the last 25 years. Dr. Landrigan. Thank, thank you, John. Um, so thanks to Bob Harrison and Barbara Materner and um, the, the folks who, who asked me to come out and, um, and, and, and participate in this event. I, I think this, Bob Harrison told me that the, the reason for coming was that this, this is going to go down as a historic day that, that, that marks a major watershed event in the history of the regulation and the control and the eventual elimination of, of lead poisoning in the United States. His, his logic was that whatever California does, the feds will eventually, eventually being the operative word, will, <laughs> will, will follow. And, and therefore, it's, it's very important that we, that we get it right here. So you've, you've heard from all three of our speakers this morning, and each in their own elegant way, that the, the current federal lead standard that was established in my recollection says 1978 is is based on what was strong science in that time more than 30 years ago but is now outdated science we we've learned so much about lead in the years since then levels of lead that we then thought were safe for the population we now know are not safe and so what i'd like to do since you've heard so much this morning and early this afternoon about the effects of lower levels of lead on adults as somebody who's doubly trained, cross-trained in both pediatrics and occupational medicine, I'd like to talk about the, uh, expand what you've already heard lightly touched upon, and that are the, the fetal and, and the developmental effects of lead. And um, to give you the headline first and then to drill into the details, we now know that, that lead is toxic to the human fetus, the human infant, the young human child, right down to the very lowest levels that are measurable. In fact, the, um, the World Health Organization has basically taken a very firm stand in a recent publication that just came out within the last year or so from WHO headquarters in Geneva, uh, where they state in their, in their summary of this document, I'll read you the one sentence, Quote, there appears to be no threshold level below which lead causes no injury to the developing human brain. They, they don't recommend a blood lead level of zero. They don't quite cross that bridge. But they do say unequivocally that there is no such thing as a safe level of lead in blood. So with that as a starting point, let me take you back a bit through history and then, and then talk a bit about... Um, where we are today in terms of knowing about the developmental effects of, 
lead exposure in early life. So back in the 1980s, in the early years after the, after the establishment of the OSHA lead standard, uh, a, a somewhat bizarre and unexpected consequence of the OSHA lead standard was that several uh, companies that were handling lead uh, instituted what were called fetal protection policies. Uh, it was known already back then that lead was toxic to infants and children at low levels. We, di we didn't know that it was as toxic as far down as we know today, but nonetheless we knew already that the, the, there was differential toxicity between adults and children. And in recognition of, of that, uh, various uh, uh, members of the lead industry took various measures to protect women of childbearing age against lead. And I, th I, I can't speak to people's motives. I think part of it was, was genuine human concern. They were worried about poisoning babies and didn't want that to happen. Nobody likes to poison babies. And, and secondly, there were liability issues that whereas the working woman, uh, whereas the liability of the company for damages caused to the working women was limited under workers' compensation law, there were no limits to what the fetus, the unborn child, could uh, any suit that the that that child could subsequently bring against a company that had caused elevated exposure to lead during pregnancy. So, for some for out of some mix of those various motives, fetal protection policies were established. Some companies uh, took a more benign route to fetal protection policies, and simply declared that they would not let women. Of, re, of childbearing age or women who are reproductively capable work with lead. That was one strategy that was employed. Another strategy which was not done commonly but did, but did take place and was written up in the papers at that time was basically a couple, at least one or two employers required women of reproductive age to produce documentary evidence from a physician that they'd had a hysterectomy performed so that they were therefore obviously incapable of bearing, bearing children. Those were the strategies that were developed in the first half, really, of the 1980s. Those strategies were ruled illegal. Um, good thing, I, I think. Um, and, um, and, and they were no more. But also the fact, that the dialogue that the, that the publicity around those strategies provoked prompted a small group of us to, to write a couple of articles back in the 1980s, the, the long form of the article appeared in a journal called um, New Solutions, which was edited by, at that time by Chuck Levenstein at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. And then there was a short two-page version that appeared as an editorial in the American Journal of Public Health. And in, uh, in those two articles, which basically covered the same ground, my colleagues and I, the colleagues were Ellen Silbergeld of Johns Hopkins, John Freund's, of, UC, who, of UCLA, who's been mentioned here already today, um, the late Rick Pfeffer, who worked for Federal OSHA, and myself. We looked at the differential susceptibility of adults and children. We were, we were catalyzed in our thinking by these uh, heinous fetal protection policies. And in the editorial, uh, we, we wrote that it's essential that both the environmental and biological standards regulating exposure to lead in the workplace be, be sharply reduced. We said in 1980 that present standards, which are still today's present standards, are, are not protective, uh, are not protective. They, prote they provide no margin of safety against subclinical uh, lead poisoning. Uh, rather than base new standard on issues of economic and technologic feasibility, OSHA must reset the lead standard solely on the basis of the available medical evidence. And at that time, knowing what we knew back then, um, some uh, 33 years ago, uh, we recommended that the PEL for lead in the workplace, uh, I'm sorry, 23 years ago, that it be reduced to 20 micrograms per cubic meter of air. We also noted that, that uh, this is re with regard to something that you said a moment ago, Barbara, we noted that with regard to medical removal protection, it, it's all well and good to think about taking women out of the workplace because of medical removal protection, but the trouble is most pregnancies aren't planned. Um, and um, we know from the data that we heard this morning in, in the modeling talk that Dr. Bork put out, 
that it takes a long time for lead to wash out of the bones of a, of a pregnant woman. And, and so I have great difficulty thinking that medical removal protection is going to work to protect the fetus against, um, against lead. I think, I think that may be a tiny aspect of, of your assessment that you want to revisit. So that's, that's the historical background I wanted to touch upon. I, I, um, the, the, the conversation that we're having in this room today is not new, but it, it's fascinating to see that after 23 years that the baton has been picked up again, picked up by the state of California. The, um, the payoffs in terms of protecting the human fetus against lead toxicity will be very great indeed. We, we now know from a whole series of epidemiologic studies, Herb Needleman studies, Bruce Lanfear studies, and others, uh, the full range of the developmental neurotoxicity of lead. We learn, first of all, of course, about the loss of IQ that lead produces. We then learn about the shortening of attention span, which is part and parcel of the syndrome, the problems with executive function, which is to say the ability to make good judgments, uh, prefrontal cortex. That, that function is clearly diminished by lead. All of these neurotoxic effects of lead are, as far as we now know, are permanent, they're irreversible, they're not treatable, uh, chelation therapy doesn't make them go away, therefore the only way to deal with them is to prevent the lead exposure in the first place, and in the case of fetal lead poisoning, fetal brain damage caused by lead, what one must do, what our society must do, is, is protect pregnant women uh, against the effects of lead. Lastly, a word on the economic dimension of this. We did an analysis in 2002. We found that lead poisoning in the United States of America at that time was costing this country $43 billion every single year. Leo Trasandi, my colleague who's now at NYU, has recently revised that estimate in the light of more recent data and the numbers have gone up still further. So lead poisoning, childhood lead poisoning, fetal lead poisoning remains a very uh, expensive burden for, for this country. But it's also worth pointing out that we saved an, an, an extraordinary amount of money, one might call it an Avogadro's amount of money, as, as, a, as, a, as a consequence of getting lead out of gasoline. And let me take my last 17 seconds to, to, explain, to explain this and, and, and reassure you in California that you're absolutely on the right track here. So the Joel Schwartz at Harvard and Richard Jackson, many of you know when he was at CDC, and some of their colleagues got together and did an economic analysis of the benefit that accrued to this country as the consequence of getting lead out of gasoline. And it went like this. They, they showed that the mean blood lead level in American children dropped between 1976 and the early 1980s, dropped from about 18 micrograms per deciliter down to around two micrograms per deciliter. They calculated that that drop in mean blood lead level produced a population-wide increase in the IQ of children born since 1980, around four to five points. And then do the arithmetic. We have four million babies born in this country every year. Give them each four or five points of IQ. And then put a dollar figure on the IQ point. And the economists say that an IQ point is worth about $10,000 over a lifetime in terms of increasing a person's productivity over the 40 plus years of their working life. You do that math, four million times four or five times 10,000, and you get an economic benefit of 200, of, of 200 billion dollars in each crop of babies born in this country since 1980. That's an aggregate uh, return to the economy of six trillion dollars over the past 30 years as a consequence of getting lead out of gasoline. So anybody who talks about economics and says that it's not a good expenditure of money to lower blood lead levels, the answer is they haven't read the literature. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Landrigan. Uh, our next discussant is Dr. Dale Haddis. Dr. Haddis holds a PhD. Uh, in genetics from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of California here at Berkeley. For the past uh, 39 years, Dr. Haddis has been engaged in the development and application of methodologies to assess the health, ecological, and economic impacts of regulatory actions. His work has focused on the development of methodology to incorporate intra-intervention intra, 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 
inter-individual variability data and quantitative mechanistic information into risk assessments for both cancer and non-cancer endpoints. He is currently a member of the National Toxicology uh, Program's Board of Scientific Counselors. In the past, he has served as a member of the Environmental Health Committee of the EPA Science Advisory Board and is a member of the Food Quality Protection Act Science Review Board. Uh, he has been a counselor and is a fellow of the uh, Society for Risk Analysis. Dale? Thank you. Uh, this is a, a very novel and interesting experience for me because I get to revisit something that started 36 years ago, at least started for me, when I was asked by, um, to participate in a group by John Freund's and uh, other group at MIT uh, to try to estimate not the air lead blood lead relationship. Oh, you don't have to think All right, sorry. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't wonder. Right. Okay. I, I, the, the idea wasn't to shed light on that because we thought we had information on that from existing studies of air leads and blood leads in battery plants and other things like that. What we wanted, what we, what, what there wasn't any data on that was necessary for to was this new idea of having medical removal protection, uh, that you would remove workers from exposure if they reached too large a, a blood lead level, like 60 or something, or 80, uh, uh, and keep them off uh, exposure until they fell down to some lower blood lead level. Well, that hadn't been done before. And in order to get the re that regulation past the OMB, uh, we needed to have some kind of ec economic analysis of what, what the dynamics of this kind of process would be, how, how much would it cost. Uh, and so uh, I went into the literature and found two dynamic models of lead in the body, one based uh, on a relatively limited set of eight months observations uh, in people uh, by Rabinowitz. Another had, was, was done uh, for purposes of radiation protection. They wanted to say, okay, if you ingested some radioactive lead, how much radiation dose do you expect? And for that purpose, the, there were some observations made in baboons. And that came out with a more complicated model. But when I compared the expectations of those models with uh, observations of a Canadian strike before the OSARCO data existed, uh, it turned out that, that blood lead levels were persisting large to a large, at higher levels to a larger extent, particularly in the long tenured workers um, that were at, during, during and after the strike. And that therefore I uh, chose to try to apply the uh, more complicated baboon-based model rather than the, than the eight months model um, from, the, from the human that was only three compartments. Um, so I bought myself a brand new Texas Instruments calculator <laughs> that had almost 200 steps of memory. Uh, and I, you know, it took a little while, so I ran it overnight under my pillow. Uh, and, uh, came out with something that could be used as a basis for predicting what the, the dynamics of lead might be uh, following exposures uh, that would raise blood lead levels up to the, the MRP um, removal concentrations and, and follow. As a side benefit, it turns out that, that because of the long-term storage of blood lead in bone and the re-release over time, we also uh, shed some light on what the likely expectation would be for the relationship between air lead and blood lead in long, long tenured workers. And that, that helped in uh, evaluating the, the, the desirability of the permissible air exposure limits. But anyway, it's astonishing and gratifying to me to find that work started 36 years ago is still being uh, used today. And the researchers in this case, you know, 
Kathleen Vork, as she presented some of her results earlier, showed shown excellent professionalism uh, and dedication to getting the final predictions as true to the data uh, as possible through several painstaking uh, iteration and thorough disclosure of the final model fits and the processes for uh, achieving uh, those fits. There is some opportunity for further tweaks in the kinetic modeling. Uh, first, some sensitivity analysis might be in order. Uh, the parameter set derived evidently clearly produces acceptable fits to the data, but how much would the policy relevant conclusions change with other choices of acceptable fits uh, to the data? And, and this is just basically a way of communicating, you know, if you're going to say, okay, this is the, the time that you, you expect removal to happen, well, how sensitive is that to other choices that could have been made that would still produce acceptable uh, fits? Further, we want to have workers uh, of both sexes involved. Uh, we won't, don't want to limit people's opportunity because of their gender. Uh, so we want to have models that uh, recognize possible differences uh, uh, between the sexes in kinetics. And so it's, 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 a, it's a fair question to ask, uh, how different would those predictions be for uh, workers of different gender? And, and finally, because we're worried about um, uh, lead exposure during pregnancy uh, as a, affecting fetal body weights, uh, and, um, among other important parameters, uh, you know, how should the model be adapted uh, for the effects of, of pregnancy? What, we, we, we think there's likely to be greater fractional uptake of lead because of the use of the same transporter system uh, for lead that's needed for calcium. Uh, some, there's going to be some likely release of lead from bones in late pregnancy if enough of the calcium isn't available uh, from the diet. And uh, of course, it's likely to be a shorter period of pre-pregnancy exposure uh, than a full working lifetime if you're going to have, have children in your 20s and 30s and, 40, and maybe early 40s. Uh, Low level, in my humble opinion, low level effects of lead amply justify efforts to re further reduce worker exposures uh, into the 5 to 10 microgram to deci deciliter range. Low level effects on birth weight represent essentially an important signal for likely indirect impacts on infant mortality, uh, neurodevelopmental impairment, and likely other effects, uh, as Phil has already uh, gone through. From experience with other toxins, such effects uh, are likely to be uh, nearly linear, more nearly linear than threshold-like, uh, um, although they may be. This is an example of some toxicological data on effects of trichloroethylene, trichloroacetic acid, uh, on fetal rate response of, of, of rats. You can see that there's, there's, it's not exactly linear, but it's, it's close to linear. Uh, similar. Uh, some data of Smith for dichloroacetic acid. Essentially, the, th the idea you should be thinking about a toxic exposure during pregnancy that uh, it's like a tax on the resources that the developing uh, embryo has to, de has to, developing fetus has to, to, to de grow and develop and protect itself before it gets uh, exposed to the real world. Uh, this is a continuous relationship in people between birth weight and infant mortality. Uh, and you see it's a broad, continuous uh, uh, change. So if you, if you over a, a broad range of, birth, of prior birth, uh, of birth weights in the absence of, of exposure, if you, if you move that curve to the left, you can see that you would expect to increase uh, overall the uh, infant mortality rate. Uh, and this is a calculation that I won't go through in any detail that basically says that if you expect a, even a 1% shift in the birth weight, and if that's a signal for associated causal factors in causing the excess infant mortality, uh, then you expect something like a 0.3 per 1,000 uh, increase in the uh, expected uh, neonatal and infant mortality. So I think that's the, the sort of the take-home lesson, and I think 
means that you, you really ought to be taking serious account of exposures that uh, give even a barely detectable uh, in change in the birth weight distribution uh, in uh, humans. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Haddis, and we regret the absence of the lavalier microphone. Uh, but uh, moving on now, uh, Dr. Rosenen is a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at Michigan State University. Uh, he is the co-lead also of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists Occupational Health Subcommittee. He received his uh, medical degree from the New York Medical College in 1975. He's a fellow of the American College of Epidemiology and the American College of Preventive Medicine at Michigan State. Uh, he, his, his active research program in occupational and environmental disease uh, is flourishing with particular interest uh, in the methodology for tracking, for tracking occupational conditions, lead toxicity, and the etiology of various pulmonary diseases. Ken. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to echo uh, Phil's comments. I, I appreciate being invited and the importance of this in the future and hopefully nudging, but not eventually, uh, federal OSHA along. So I have four points I'd like to make. Uh, one, I, I think it's been stated, um, but I, I want to reemphasize that the current uh, standard, OSHA standard uh, for lead is really based on acute toxicity. And um, Dr. Kosnett did an excellent job uh, you know, over the last 35 years the, um, the chronic, the issues of uh, cro adverse chronic effects from lead. And just to, to reminisce, I, I had the opportunity back in 77, 78, I was an occupational medicine resident and submitted data to the, uh, the lead docket at that time. And I was working with um, Dr. Sid Wolf at the Public Citizen Health Research Group. And we were looking at anemia and we found an association at 30, which, you know, that was low at that time because we're talking about a, acceptable blood leads of 80 at that time. And you had the physicians for the various lead companies arguing there was no problem below 80. And it, partially that was sort of self-fulfilling because the way the regs read then, you didn't have to examine anybody if their blood lead was before 80. So clearly they didn't have symptoms because you didn't know anything about them. And, and even at that time, you know, the academic uh, research community said the, the acceptable blood lead was 30 or 40. Companies were arguing 80. And, it, you know, the, the, it was a compromise. OSHA came up with 60. And um, to me, it was really a compromise decision. So I want to emphasize we've learned a lot over the last 35 years, but our standards are still based on uh, acute toxicity data. So that was point one. Uh, the second point I want to make is, um, you know, for people, maybe um, physicians who, who practice occupational medicine, they may not be used to the, these medical management guidelines that the uh, California Department of Public Health have promulgated or at least suggested as guidelines that Dr. Kosnett mentioned in the article, and they've recently been updated. But I, I think there's pretty broad consensus for these guidelines. And so the, the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists, which, recommend, which represents all the occupational health um, professionals at the state health departments, has endorsed these guidelines. The Association of Occupational and Environmental Clinics, um, which it represents 60 occupational environmental medicine clinics across the country, um, has endorsed these guidelines. So I think there is widespread support, and I um, would thank California for taking the lead and um, coming up with these um, medical guidelines. The third point I want to make, uh, uh, just or reemphasize, and uh, Dr. Materna um, mentioned it, is that you know there are aspects to the lead standard that are just not practical, and it's good to see that, you know, for instance, um, not tying blood leads to air levels. I mean, that, that's very important. You know, imagine how you would enforce a standard in the construction industry where you have to have an air level before you do something. I mean, things are moving too quickly there. And, and so there's a whole bunch of things not related to air level, not related to even the blood 
where the blood leads are not, or suggested they not be tied in uh, to the air levels. And I think that's very important. My fourth point was you saw this slide that was distracted you all this time. Um, so this is not my data, uh, although the ABLE state, so this is something funded by NIOSH, the Adult Blood Lead uh, Epidemiologic Surveillance System. Uh, Barbara mentioned it in terms of California, but this is something that's been funded by NIOSH in over 40 states. And uh, NIOSH, uh, Dr. Steelen and his group at Emory had a, an R01 um, that took the, um, the data from 11 of the ABLE states, because there were issues of confidentiality and how you go about following up people. So these, all these states have this mandatory requirement that blood leads be reported to them uh, from their laboratory. So we're talking about all the blood leads that have occurred in these 11 states. And he followed them up uh, using the National Death Index to look at mortality in people who had elevated blood leads. So everything's here. It's funded by NIOSH. So thank you, John. Um, and um, so what hasn't been discussed at all today, although there have been a number of studies, but there's not a, a good consensus. IARC has not uh, come out and said that lead is a carcinogen, but clearly in animal studies, lead acetate um, is an animal carcinogen, and, um, and there is mixed data in the epidemiologic, uh, but this is uh, data that uh, Dr. Steelen has uh, shared with me. It's not published yet. He's still in the process of writing it up and, and presenting it, so this is, you can consider this fresh before the press here. And, and so we're talking about a large cohort of individuals, right? We got a, over 58,000 men uh, from these 11 states. And in the, during the follow-up period, and so these are blood leads that were done mainly in the 2000s from these 11 states. And um, there were approximately 3,000 deaths. So there's a strong, so these are all, 95% or so of these are workers. That's how they were exposed to their lead. And so there's a, a, a overall cause standardized mortality ratio. There's a strong healthy worker effect. So the overall um, risk for death is less than one, um, which you would expect in a working population. There's not a long follow-up. But looking at the highest blood lead that re was reported to these 11 states, um, you can see at 40, greater than 40 micrograms per deciliter, there was this increased risk of lung cancer, a 20% increased risk, and for laryngeal vocal cord cancer, 100% or so. Um, I think in terms of looking, he did not break the data down between 5 and 10, but use those categories you see there. But there's a statistically increased uh, risk um, for lung cancer uh, with uh, increasing exposure. Um, so I, I think it's another cumulative effect that uh, needs to be thought about in terms of cancer. It may not be what's driving uh, the concern. Um, but, um, you know, there, this will be, is just the beginning of, of, of the follow-up of these individuals, and hopefully there'll be more data from this group in the future. So I will, and there before you showed me my 10 minutes sign. Thank you, Ken. Our fourth uh, discussant is Dr. Leslie Israel. Dr. Israel is a clinical professor at the University of California at Irvine Center for Occupational and Environmental Health where she serves as the Occupational Medicine Residency Program Director and the Medical Director of the uh, Center's Specialty Practice. Uh, Dr. Israel received her uh, internship and residency training at Yale University. She's board certified in occupational medicine, and currently she serves as the 2013 uh, President of the Western Occupational Medical Association. Leslie? Thank you, Dr. Howard. Um, I want to extend a sincere thank you to the organizers of this symposium to allow WOMA, the Western Occupational Environmental Medicine Association, um, to lend their voice. Um, WOMA 
uh, is an organization representing over 600 occupational medicine physicians and occupational health, other occupational health providers. And we cover five Western states, California, Hawaii, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. We're a regional component of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. And I'm very pleased to say that there are members of WOMA and ACOM uh, in this audience, as well as hopefully um, online with us. Um, I would like to recognize, though, a couple people are, one of our board of directors is here in the audience, Dr. Blink. And I, I want to give a special note of appreciation, as I've heard prior um, scholarly speakers talking about their history of it. Well, 20 years ago, Dr. Paul um, Papanik, uh, past president of WOMA, um, began the push, the gentle nudge by WOMA, um, to do something about the standard. So as you've heard, this is something that's important to all of us, and it's, it's been especially important to um, the WOMA members. Um, why? Our WOMA members are in the trenches, and so we deal with employers, we deal with employees, we diagnose, and we treat lead exposures and lead poisonings. Unfortunately, it is a concern today. So when CDPH um, presented these guidelines, we had the opportunity to work with our lead physician, um, Dr. Raymond Meister, and uh, collaborate with the others on this. And that was um, followed by, um, let me, followed by a letter of support in 2009. And you know, let me just say that guidelines are great, but they're not standards. And if you're in the trenches, you can understand what I'm talking about. So, and a note about um, the providers and knowing what's going on with the guidelines, I want to thank Dr. Kosnett as well, because he did present a web webinar on these guidelines, which were very useful to our members. And again, guidelines are great. We need the standards. So in November 2009, Wilma directed a letter to the Cal OSHA um, director at the time, Len Welsh, supporting the revisions of the Cal OSHA lead standards. And again, it's based on the evidence you've heard. Um, the uh, EHP article and this guidance. Then again, in January of 2012, we directed a statement to the Cal OSHA advisory committee. And it was again about some revisions it was, again, pushing, nudging. <laughs> so relevant to today's uh, symposium, um, I just want to highlight a few things which you've already heard. Um, but some of the goals we would hope that would happen would be, again, we favor a regulatory trigger for blood lead testing, ensuring that all workers with potentially significant lead exposure, whether through inhalation or ingestion or both, are enrolled in a medical surveillance program. Again, as noted previously, um, frequent blood lead monitoring is essential. And um, in our 2012 note, we put in twice a year uh, for exposed workers, and more frequently with blood lead levels above 10 micrograms per deciliter. And we'd also favor um, improved triggers for preventive practices, and we list them here. Education, education, education. Let ex education about the exposure, about hygiene practices, and PPE. So again, education. And, and as uh, Dr. Landrigan pointed out, it's education about not only the worker, but the family, and the impact it has on your family, on the worker's family, is extremely important. I mean, you've heard about the economics of it, and you've heard other things. So 
I'm in the trenches and our members are in the trenches. We think this is important. We hope that 2012 will be the year, 2012, 2014, 2014 will be the year that Cal OSHA can make this happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Um, we are 10 minutes ahead of schedule, which is great. So we're going to take our afternoon break now. And instead of reconvening uh, at 2.50, we're going to reconvene at 2.40. That will give everybody a nice break. So those of you online, we're going to start again at 2.40. We're going to have the three panelists and the discussants uh, up at the top. And we're going to go through your questions, uh, the questions you handed in on the cards, as well as any questions from uh, the web. Uh, and also any here in the room. So, uh, 240. It's been there uh, 18 years. Wow. It's yeah. a time flies. We're not letting the men sit together, please. <laughs> Tell Andy I said hello. I talk to I will. Every I'll do it. I'll do it. He's still, he's, uh, oh, yeah. he's, he's, he's still doing some bone wet. He's, he's, but he oh, told yeah. me he was doing something else. He told me he was doing he, some other. Uh, he spent a couple of years very heavily engaged in the work that we're continuing to do in the World Trade Center program. He, um, he felt a very yeah. strong emotional bond to that program. And um, from we got a whole bunch of these. I don't know how you're going to do it, but we'll just know it. Yeah. So she's back. Yeah. Okay, we're going to uh, start again, and uh, hopefully everyone uh, online is uh, joining us also uh, to restart. Uh, this is the fun part. Uh, we get to ask questions. And uh, one disclaimer, um, I'm not a handwriting expert, so if your handwriting is challenging, uh, God knows what kind of question will come out of my mouth. Uh, and I apologize for that. Um, we've got a lot of questions, and uh, I apologize also if we can't get to them uh, all today. Um, I'm going to start out with one question that I think Dale may have answered for Dr. Vork. Um, but this is a question, uh, did OEHA perform a sensitivity analysis of the impacts of alternative GI absorption assumptions on the model results, particularly for conclusions regarding the impact of particle size on estimates of uptake of lead from inhaled particles? A simple yes or no would do, Kathy. <laughs> Qualitative uh, sensitivity analysis, I guess, is the, is the answer. Um, oh. um, we did not do a quantitative sensitivity analysis, however, we ran hundreds and hundreds of scenarios and uh, they so in, and and we also um, extracted the from sensitivity analysis or learned from the sensitivity analysis that other uh, researchers had done and focused on those 
um, parameter parameters. Okay. Anybody else can always chime in about a question, so you know, don't don't hesitate. Um, another question: the model appears to be based on consistent lead exposure. How well do you think the model will work for intermittent lead exposure? Yeah, I think it's it's going to work reasonably well because you, you, the 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 short term responsiveness is not huge, but but it's, it's going to it's going to tend to average out uh, over over a longer time. Okay. Uh, because you've got the shorter term compartments which have uh, of the order of one or two months, uh, at inter intrinsically averaging, and you know, to the the trabecular lead, which is more like uh, a year or so or two, uh, to the uh, deep bone lead, the cortical lead, which is going to be uh, effectively s smearing things over uh, decades. Smearing is that a risk assessor's? Uh, <laughs> I think it's it's graphic, right? It's graphic. It is graphic. You want to be graphic. Right. Thank you for that. So um, communicate the messiness. Of well, don't go too far in that direction. Uh, you could have a problem. So, a, a question from the web: The half-life of lead in bone is assumed to be in the order of many years. The Leggett Plus model predicts that it will take less than that to reduce blood levels by fifty percent. Is there an inconsistency here? Uh, volunteer, no. volunteer. Uh, no, uh, basically, a relatively modest portion of the lead in blood is maintained by the retransfer of lead from the bone to the to to the blood. The a lot of the lead in blood is in rapid equilibrium with stores in the soft tissues. Yeah. Exactly. And and to just expand, you know, on that think of it it's a it's a multi compartment model, right? So the fast compartment, which is blood, when you re, when you remove someone from exposure, that falls relatively quickly. So you'll see something that goes down quickly and then it'll come down slower. So the initial decline uh, uh, is due to uh, the the soft tissues, that labile compartment being quickly reduced because you're turning off exogenous exposure. And then you have a slower decline. So it's a multi-compartment decline. It's not a steady decline. Now just remember, everybody's looking at me. These aren't my questions. They're their questions, OK? So you don't have to explain it to me. Um, OK, so a question about pregnant women. And, and it says for Dr. Kosnett, uh, Dr. Vork, but, but anybody. What are your recommendations for protecting pregnant women exposed to lead in the workplace? Do you want to summarize those for everybody today? Sure. Uh, pre pregnant women are uh, particularly uh, vulnerable because of all the endpoints uh, that have been studied, uh, the, the effects on uh, the developing nervous system of the fetus and, and the young child uh, are considered um, to be the most sensitive. And uh, the lead is, um, is transported transplacentally. So if a, if a pregnant woman is exposed, uh, her uh, fetus uh, is going to be exposed. And, and generally speaking, when um, you have mother-infant pairs, the baby's born with a, a lead level, which is about 85% of what the mother's is. So uh, right now, um, the current guidance, for example, by CDC, is that children um, should maintain, have blood levels maintained below five. So that's why we think it's prudent for pregnant women to maintain blood levels below five. Anybody else? No? We're okay? Okay, um, this is, uh, oh, yeah. oh, yep. I mean, uh, this is probably further than, than a California state agency can go, but I, I, th I think a case can be made uh, for not having women work at all around lead during pregnancy. It's probably illegal to do that because of um, sex discrimination, but um, uh, it's probably good public health. And a lot of European countries actually uh, take women out of leaded workplaces for the duration of pregnancy and, of course, pay them at the same level uh, 
for doing for doing other work. It's it's something to consider. And one uh, admonition to the panel: grab the microphone, put your mouth near it, so everybody on the web can hear you. Because we're having a little trouble on the web, so keep that in mind. Um, uh, a question for the web: What are your thoughts, Dr. Kosnett, about chelation treatment for low-level blood lead to prevent long-term consequences? Mm -hmm. no, there's there's no evidence uh, that. Uh, that chelation for individuals with low levels of lead exposure would uh, avert um, long-term consequences. And uh, actually, if you look at um, the amount of lead that's mobilized by a course of chelation in comparison to even recent exposure, it's relatively modest. So I uh, think the uh, role of ke there is no role for chelation in low-level lead exposure. Can I expand on that further? I, I agree exactly with what Michael has said. I get very cross with people that come to me clinically and request chelation therapy for the treatment of various ailments. And I say what Michael has just said, that there's no evidence of benefit. And I also note that there's positive evidence of harm. There have been fatalities from chelation, especially self-administered oral chelation. And the fatalities apparently are the result of the fact that the chelating agents are non-discriminant, they go after any divalent cation such as calcium, magnesium, and pull it out of the body as readily as they pull out uh, the, the metals. So I would just add, by no evidence could mean there are no studies or there are negative studies. And I believe there's some sort of negative studies that it doesn't mm -hmm. help, mm -hmm. not just the absence of studies that it might help. Okay. All right, Dr. Vork, <clears throat> what is the basis for the clearance time assumptions for particles deposited in various portions of the respiratory tract? Uh, are there documentation studies to support these clearance estimates? And then is there similar documentation for the GI tract condition estimates? One exercise that we carried out and is reported in our report is that we ran the um, MPPD2 model um, in deposition and clearance mode. And that showed that a five, let's see, that a five day tracheal bronchial deposition of lead in radiated workers was rapidly cleared by the seventh day. And um, as, as, can you, can you uh, restate the question again? Uh, well, it? you know, if I could find it again, I would. <laughs> um, so it's the clearance time issues and the documentation for clearance time uh, in the model for lung and for GI. That's essentially, they're looking for substantiation. How did you come to those clearance time estimates? Are there documented studies? Or did you guess? <laughs> <laughs> I know risk assessment. That's the one thing I know. <laughs> we, um, well, like I say, we, we, we ran the, the MPPD model um, in, in one case. Uh, one of the external reviewers suggested that we um, use a um, an assumption of high, highly soluble um, particles that that uh, clear rapidly, and um, that's as far as we went. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I don't know precisely what the question means by clearance time because I, I think if, if they're talking about percent uptake. I can, I can address that if they're talking about percent uptake from the gastrointestinal tracker. Yes, there have been, uh, there, there are uh, empiric data to support the, the ranges that were applied uh, by Dr. Vork in that parameter. There have been studies done with stable isotopes administered uh, to humans. There has ac uh, actually have been some um, inhalation studies that were done in the early 70s with uh, some short-lived radioactive isotopes. and. Uh, looking at uptake. And uh, essentially, um, there, there is uh, consistent evidence that um, 
lead deposit in the alveoli is uh, very extensively uh, absorbed, uh, approaching 100%, mm -hmm. okay. particularly for fine particles, and that in the gastrointestinal tract, it depends, as the model uh, assumed, um, based on the amount of uh, food, and, um, and that lead on an empty stomach uh, is absorbed perhaps up to 50, 45, 50% in an adult, and uh, with uh, the presence of food, it's, uh, it's considerably lower. It could be about 15 percent, 12 percent. So the, the, um, I thought it was uh, actually a fairly sophisticated job that OEHA decided to actually assume not just a one absorption level for lead in the gut, but to actually model how much might be uh, uh, ingested on an empty stomach with food and um, uh, with with liquid, and I, and that's actually a very sophisticated uh, step to do that, and I, I thought that was uh, um, a positive thing that they did. So, go ahead. Just one, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, that that uh, that was based on a mul a multiple studies that um, Dr. Leggett had um, synthesized and uh, summarized in his 1993. Um, well, uh, description of yeah. his original model. And it's based on, the important point is it's based on experiments conducted on humans. So most of the questions, you know, relate to the model, but here's a memory question for you, Barbara. Are you ready? <laughs> Please restate the comment about ZPP test from slide six on page three. <laughs> Happy to. Uh, what we said was we recommended that blood lead testing frequency be increased, but we also recommended eliminating routine zinc pro protoporphyrin testing. And the reason behind that is um, that though the results of the ZPP test are not useful, uh, the ZPP doesn't begin to rise until you get blood leads at higher levels above, 20, above 25 or so uh, and higher. And so you're paying for a test that isn't gonna give you useful results, so we think there should be a trade-off with more frequent blood lead testing. Okay, very good. You passed the memory test. Uh, the assumption of a 26 liter per minute inhalation rate is higher than typical occupational standards. How would the air lead estimate change if 20 liters per minute was assumed? 26 meters cubed per day is multiplied by the 30% um, transfer rate. And uh, that fits the data very well. Um, she said smugly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, to, to lower the, the breathing rate would, um, would mean that the data would, that the model would not fit the data as well. Um, that's one thing. And also, the original um, Leggett model assumed 15 um, meters cubed per day for the general population and an, uh, an overall absorption of 37%. So there isn't a large difference between those two mm. estimates. Okay, very good. Okay, Dr. Kuznet, now I'm going to try to read this question, and I apologize to the author if I get it wrong. Ra this is about blood pressure. Rather than postulating varying susceptibility of the population to low blood leads relative to blood pressure, is it also plausible that a portion of those studied had greater elevations in bone lead reflecting greater cumulative lead exposure? According for according accounting for higher observed blood pressure, would it be possible to adjust for bone lead when evaluating the relationship between uh, uh, blood lead and body uh, body burden? I think I'm not 100 percent sure. For example, in the normative aging study, you get it? Yeah, I, okay. I do. Uh, let me restate the question. I, uh, Thank you. I think Please do. <laughs> I, I think it, it's, it's saying that if you were to evaluate in a population um, the impact of, of blood lead as a, va a, per, a predictor variable on the one hand and bone lead as a predictor variable on the other, how might they, their presence affect in one another? And actually, that has been done in the normative aging study. And 
And when you look at the normative aging study, for example, uh, either in the prospective analyses or in uh, the cross-sectional analyses, when you enter blood lead and bone lead in the model, blood lead is not, uh, is not significant. It falls out of the model, okay? The, the effect of, of uh, lead on blood pressure is more accurately captured by long-term cumulative exposure as reflected in lead in bone and not by lead in blood. So the studies where they've had both measurements, bone lead has be, been more predictive. Okay. Uh, this person's been doing Twitter too long. Uh, okay. Vorx PBK model, period. Question on solubility <laughs> assumptions of lead, air gut exposure into blood. Lead compounds, except acetates, nitrates, chlorides are generally insoluble. Basis, question mark. It's a tweet. Perhaps it's a tweet. <laughs> we had to pick something, <laughs> and um, if the if the um, the the um, high solubility was the conservative choice, and that's there's actually, and and I would add. Um, there's actually uh, a study by Morrow, um, I think it was in 1999, although I have to double check on that, uh, that looked at fine particles and uh, the absorption actually did not differ much in, in, from the alveoli depending on, based on the solubility. There was, um, and, and somewhat to my surprise in that study, that, that the absorption was fairly good as long as the particle was fine. It was a very fine particle from the alveoli, which most alveolar particles would be the absorption was uh, fairly similar. Okay, Barbara. Based on the lead program, California lead program's data for 2012, existing efforts, regulatory and otherwise, are incredibly effective and successful. Only four tests were over 50, and total number of employees tested over 30 is less than 100. Shouldn't this tell us that we are on the right track and should concentrate on education, outreach, and assistance? Okay. Uh, didn't you hear what Leslie had to say? Guidelines are good, but standards are good or <laughs> better. Um, I, I hoped that one of the key messages in my presentation was uh, really to highlight one of the key limitations of registry data, which are how many lead-exposed workers don't appear in our registry data due to lack of testing or uh, or don't appear in the right industry due to la missing information on the on the blood lead reports that come in. Um, I, you know, we have done over the years uh, quite a lot of different things to try to impress upon employers uh, the value of blood lead testing. First of all, to see if your sa safety program is working, uh, to to see if blood leads are going up you know, while they're low, so that you never have anybody on medical removal protection and don't have the economic and disruptive consequences of having people out on MRP. So we will continue to do everything that we can to try to impress that, that upon people. But, uh, you know, standards are, additional, are an additional way to help, you know, convince uh, people of how important this is. Um, and, you know, one other point that I made uh, in my presentation was uh, that one of our previous recommendations to Kalosha was uncoupling blood lead testing from air monitoring. Um, having a trigger for required blood lead testing that of, you know, airborne lead levels as high as 30 micrograms per cubic meter uh, is just not adequate. We have those situations where ingestion exposure is going on. We've, we've seen significant lead poisoning cases over the years. Low air lead levels or something changes in the workplace over time. So low lead, air lead levels, you know, creep up. But, uh, you know, we haven't talked a lot about ingestion, but ingestion really is the way a lot of workers end up getting elevated blood lead levels. And so this can be picked up by frequent blood lead testing and it would be a service to employers to have that information uh, on which to evaluate their lead sa safety efforts, and we, we strongly promote it. <laughs>
Ken, did you want um, to? Yeah, I just uh, add some data from Michigan in that um, some of the worst actors in this, I mean, they're not doing blood lead testing, Ames, because they're not they're not required to do it and they're just not doing it. So some of the most interesting results we see is where the family practitioner, the, their private practitioner does the blood lead and then you go back to that facility and there's just no controls whatsoever. So um, if there was a requirement to do blood lead, I think you would, you'd find some of these companies or more companies, you'd find a much higher percentage above whatever level you want to pick, 40, 50, 30. I just would like to echo what um, Barbara and what we've just heard. Um, you know, I, and now I'm speaking as Leslie Israel, the person in the trenches, but you know, I have uh, cases referred and it's sometimes because the children were identified with elevated blood levels. And so they'll say, oh, Leslie, you know, because we're an AOEC um, clinic, um, I get a lot of calls and this is something I have to handle and I have to treat the adult and guess what? The adult works in one of those places where it's a small employer, they have no regs. There's no regs and the guidelines, they don't, they're not able to follow them. So um, I think that you're right. I think that if we put in some regs, I think the numbers would go, we'd see the problems. It sort of reminds me of um, mammography and how the diagnoses went up when the technology or the regs were there. Okay, Dr. Rosamond, since you made news, there's a couple questions here relating to your little news flash. Um, in relation to uh, the relationship between blood lead and mortality from lung uh, cancer, lung and laryngeal cancer, was there data tested uh, uh, on workers regarding cigarette smoking status and were the results adjusted for that confounder? And then we had a question from the web, which must have come in before you started speaking. Can any of the speakers address the relationship between lead exposure and cancer? Okay, so the answer to the second question is Yes, um, and I mean, there, if you go back to the NTP document or the EPA, I mean, there's whole sections uh, there on cancer. And, and so, as I said, the animal studies, some of the mechanistic studies are, are very clear on the effects of the carcinogenic effect, but the epidemiologic study is, studies are mixed. Uh, there's stronger studies on um, kidney cancer maybe than and lung cancer. So there, there, there are a number of limitations, which I guess I didn't express in terms of the data. Uh, one is, so this is registry data from these 11 states, and they don't have cigarette smoking data. So it, to see that, one would have to assume that the people with the higher blood leads um, were more likely to be smokers. And, um, and that's maybe possible because we know people who smoke actually, you know, they get it on their hands and then they, they start smoking, and you, uh, and so that's a possibility. The, the other limitation, which wasn't part of the question, is uh, the work exposure is not controlled for. So potentially, the people with the higher leads are in smelters, and they may have other exposure to other carcinogens, particulates, or arsenic, or something. So uh, there are some limitations to the data I presented. So this next question to me is very interesting, Dr. Landrigan, and it, it can be answered, I think, from a, a very uh, sort of 50,000-foot perspective. With all of this evidence uh, confirming the hazardous nature of lead, why is it still so common? Are there no alternative substances? If not, why is industry not getting working to develop alternatives? Why do we still have this problem? Well, that's a very interesting question that opens up a big door. And the interesting thing that I suspect many people in this room don't know, is that global production of lead is actually on the increase right now, uh, despite the fact that we've taken lead out of gasoline in all but five or six countries, such beauty spots as North Korea and Afghanistan. The um, global lead production is going up, and the reason in a single word is batteries. We need lots of batteries in today's world. Um, every little cell phone or BlackBerry uh, has a battery, but also a Prius has a great big battery. And um, that trend appears to be something that's going to continue. So uh, the problem's not going away. Substitutes? People have, certainly people have looked for substitutes. Lead has advantages. It's cheap and it's abundant. Um, it, it has disadvantages. It's heavy. Um, uh, 
uh, and it's toxic, and, and so there's lots of motivation to look for substitutes, and, and substitutes have been found in certain applications, but um, uh, it's still the economic winner, especially for the big batteries, as I understand it. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Vork, you've been resting a little too long, uh, so we'll go back. The Legate Plus uh, adjustments were primarily based on data sets from times with very different ambient and non-work lead exposures. Did OEHA correct the model's assumptions based on current ambient lead exposures? Is the difference in background lead significant? Yes, it is significant, and yes, we did correct for it uh, when we did our um, tables for Task one and task two. Great. Okay, so uh, this question uh, is for Barbara. Um, just to make sure I follow, is the California Department of Public Health recommending both an airborne PEL and a blood-led uh, PEL? Uh, let me rephrase that question <laughs> or try to. I think what they mean is do we recommend a PEL and a medical removal protection limit? Um, and yes, we did recommend both. both. I focus more today on our PEL recommendation and, and where it came from. Uh, but Dr. Kosnid also put up on one of his slides uh, recommendations for medical management that are identical to the ones in the Environmental Health Perspectives article and in our 2009 medical guidelines, um, and they recommended uh, medical removal at a single blood lead of 30 or two blood leads uh, four weeks apart above 20, uh, as well as all of the guidance that you would do and, and uh, focus on reducing exposures uh, on the lower blood lead ranges. And, and I would add to that um, that the recommendation, if I if I understand, understand it correctly, Barbara, is also allows a physician's discretion to uh, a, um, recommend uh, removal at, at a lower level if um, there are reasons to believe that the person is, has enhanced susceptibility, has uh, is vulnerable as a, on the basis of long-term exposure, or for example, in the case of pregnancy. And maybe it's more of a question or statement, but did, did not the California Department of Public Health then review or update the guidelines which you released in 2013, and maybe the levels are still the same, but you changed some of the wording. Uh, I thought there was a, a, a sort of an update of the medical management guidelines. No? Okay. I thought that. No, we took essentially the same, uh essentially the same table, and that was what was considered by the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Uh, for uh, a lot of that information is used on laboratory reports when, you know, blood lead test results come back and there's, you know, information about, uh, you know, what you should do about those levels. So some of that information is in that recommendation as well. So, Dale, you commented on this, uh, and, and maybe uh, this is something that you, you want to comment also again, and maybe uh, uh, Kathy can comment too. Um, assumptions about the breathing rates do not appear in the model, do not appear to account for gender or, or racial ethnicity males, uh, non-white males. Uh, and you assume uh, a... Uh, a, uh, something on work eight hours a day. What effects would there be on your model if workers were non-white and or female and worked 12-hour days? How would that affect the recommendations for a PEL? Uh, the uh, a change in, in the hourly, number of hours worked is something uh, that would straightforwardly affect the, the intake of the uh, uh, of lead, so it would it, it would increase the, the amount of lead, but in implementation of <coughs> occupational standards, it's um, it, the the industrial hygienist has the op option to take that into account, as I as I understand it. That you know, the, 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 if a T PEL is set on an eight-hour basis and it actually the, the workplace works twelve hours, I think you could I mean, the the, uh, the it goes down. Uh, just just in from from the online, just wanted to let Dr. Landrigan know hybrid batteries do not contain lead. 
distracted. I don't okay. Know. Thank you. Thank you for this is why we have people online because they can keep us keep us honest here. Uh, Dale, did you want to finish that thought? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, the um, there wasn't uh, the 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 I don't believe that there's a, a, a huge difference between males and females in breathing rates, although I would be open to data on that. There is a serious difference with pregnancy that, that, uh, that, is, that ha there's data on, on that. So in adapting the model to pregnancy, you would, you would want to change the, the breathing rate and probably also the, uh, the uptake characteristics because of the, uh, the, the increased transport of, of calcium by the same transporter that also transports lead. So this question, I think, has to do with the <coughs> reversibility of the findings, Dr. Kosnett, that you pointed out. Uh, the studies of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and populations with reduced blood or bone lead levels. In other words, I think they, they're talking about is this effect that you're describing, hypertension, cardiovascular, is that reversible if you do something with the lead levels, like reduce them? It's a good question. I, I don't know that that question, the, the existing data adequately addresses that. Most of the, um, you know, the, the, the data that uh, best describes the risk is associated with long-term cumulative exposure, and I am not aware of studies um, that have, uh, you know, specifically addressed whether there is a, a dynamic change in time. Uh, with exposures go down. However, I will point out, and I think it's relevant to look at, if you look at, for example, the studies that have uh, been done in, in, in adults today, uh, the recent you know, cross-sectional studies that show, for example, going from a blood lead of, uh, like Dr. Menke's studies, going from a blood lead of less than one uh, to greater than three, uh, and that there's a change in cardiovascular mortality. Uh, those don't reflect, probably, the recent exposure. They reflect the exposure that those individuals accrued earlier in life. So their uh, exposure ended, uh, their high exposure above 10 ended, uh, you know, probably in the 1980s, yet uh, we're, the, the, we're still seeing um, uh, an effect on, um, on their mortality as a consequence of their past long-term cumulative exposure. So um, it may not necessarily be reversible, uh, and if it is, it, it's certainly not a quick thing. It doesn't, your risk of uh, lead-induced cardiovascular disease and hypertension uh, doesn't end the day you lower your exposure. It, it goes on for quite a while. So this next question, uh, Barbara, is from an industrial hygienist, and I'm not qualified to read it even, uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But I am going to try to read it, and then right. your job is to see if you can interpret it, okay? <laughs> There's lots of numbers here, okay? <laughs> Assuming a typical eight-hour air sample taken at something that looks like 2, 1 p.m., or maybe that's what... Ah, there you go. Uh, 0.96 meter cubed of air is sampled per shift. This gives us reporting limits for three common analytical techniques to be flame AA, um, <laughs> atomic absorption, three, mi three micrograms per meter cube, ICP uh, 0 0.9 uh, micrograms per meter cube, graphite furnace AA 0 0.2, uh, blah, blah, blah. Assuming you want an analytical reporting limit of at least five times, 10 times would be better, Below the PEL, uh, what about the action limit question mark? The only semi-standard analytical technique that will get that, that low is ICP-MS. There isn't the capacity in the U.S. to do this work, and the price would m more than double even if there was capacity. How is this going to be addressed? Well, thanks for that question, <laughs> Dr. Howard. Um, you know, as I said in my talk, Kalosha does have to address both economic and technological feasibility uh, for, their, for, for arriving at their final standards. And technological feasibility does include things like, can you measure it adequately? Um, you know, it has to be considered both for the air and for the blood. So, you know, these things will be addressed as uh, Kalosha moves forward in the process. <laughs> 
Thank you, Barbara. Okay, Dr. Vork. Now, there's a couple questions here, I think, relating to the, to models, and I'll, I'll read them both. How dependent are the airborne lead estimates on the choice of the modified Leggett model? Question mark. What about the original Leggett model, uh, the O'Flaherty model, the EPA adult lead model? Another question, the adjusted Leggett model fits the ASARCO data. How well does it predict other data sets or individual data? Does, uh, does it or blood fit better uh, the model? L several questions about the model and the choice of the model, et cetera. We did consider those other models. And um, the all ages lead model um, was actually under revision and not available when we, when we went through this um, analysis. The O'Flaherty model is, ex you saw how, how uh, complicated the Leggett model? Well, the O'Flaherty model is about, I don't know, 10 times that, <laughs> that complicated. Um, and what we were able to get was an executable of the O'Flaherty model, and it actually um, over-predicted blood lead levels for the data sets that we looked at. Um, the original model, as you can see in my presentation, underpredicted the blood lead levels. So, um, uh, and as far as um, other data sets, we did try to get a data set of the Canadian smelter workers um, that were uh, referred to in the Nye study and a, and a, a study by Fleming and others. Um, and they were not able to give it to us because of um, human subjects issues. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, now, I'd love to hear the answer to this question, so I'll pose it to the entire panel, although it says for Dr. Kosnett, I don't know why. How persuasive is the data underlying the Kevin Drum article, I guess, or contention in Mother Jones, that decreasing lead levels explain the decrease in American youth violence? <laughs> there's, there's a fascinating correlation that was published in that journal that John alludes to. And what it showed was the following, was that the it, it begins by pointing out that the rate of murder in the United States has declined precipitously over the past couple of decades. And the authors pointed out that the decline in the murder rate took place just about 20 or 21 years after the decline in blood lead levels. The decline in blood lead levels started in 19... 76 when EPA took lead out of gasoline and a few other things were done at the same time like getting lead out of tin cans and it was largely completed by 1982 something like that and the decline in murder rate began just about 20 years later and extended over a four or five year span so the hypothesis is that the one and two year old people mainly boys because it's murder is a male thing mostly that that um, that their decline in blood lead levels in their infancy led to a decline 20 years later, approximately, in, in the murder rate. I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating hypothesis. Thank you. Now, there have been people that have followed up on that, on that paper. I was talking to a health economist at Amherst College in Massachusetts in September. I was up there. And she's been looking at declines in crime rates in various municipalities uh, in the U.S. and overseas that got let out of gasoline at different points in time so that it, you don't just have one data set and no opportunity to validate things. And she thinks that she sees evidence for the same trend in other data sets. So we'll, we'll see. I think it's, it's still a work in progress. Very good. I'm going to have to read uh, that journal. Uh, uh, so Barbara, this may relate to an answer you gave uh, a few minutes ago. Most high blood lead levels are certainly due to operations without controls and excessively high exposures. How are companies that cannot comply with current PEL going to comply with a standard that's one-tenth of that? Why not enforce current standards and analyze results? Well, you know, again, I think this is something that Kalosh is going to have to examine. Um, we don't have a lot of data on air lead levels because we have operated blood lead registry, and also because many employers don't share it voluntarily their air monitoring data. So I, I, I'm, I'm going out there on a limb, but I suspect that Kalosha would welcome uh, 
information from industries about their processes and the associated air lead levels that would contribute to the discussion and the you know, assessment of what's feasible to do for different types of operations. So following that up, why bother with an air PEL if you will require blood lead testing by all employee, employers? Blood leads are a better indicator of exposure and a, a relevant air concentration is not easily measurable. So why not just require employers to implement controls based on blood lead? I think this topic was really a hot topic back in 1978 when the federal OSHA original standard was passed. Um, you know, just the whole concept of using workers as guinea pigs, you know, let their blood leads rise and then we'll think about doing something about it is sort of, uh, you know, not acceptable in occupational health. Uh, we really, you know, are prevention oriented oriented, and so obviously bringing air lead levels down uh, is, you know, the way to prevent blood leads from going higher. Um, you know, we talked earlier about there isn't a threshold for lead health effects, so, you know, I think our goal is to identify the things that are associated with this excessive exposures and, and really to, uh, you know, the standard already says that you are required to use uh, engineering controls to the extent feasible uh, to bring down exposures. And I, and I think there has to be more emphasis there to uh, really challenge the industries to bring down levels. Yeah. I agree. I think, there's a role, I think there's a role for both. I think there's a role for a PEL to guide uh, how we can reduce uh, airborne exposure, but I think that there's also a role for blood lead monitoring, uh, which captures... Uh, um, exposures irrespective of the pathway. So, Kathy, um, will OEHA revise its PEL recommendation to consider the problem of potential lead exposure of less than 30 days? We're back to the intermittent exposure per year, considering your statement that this is a limitation of the model. I stated that it was a limitation uh, of the model. Uh, uh, Dr. Volk's statement that this is a major flaw in the model. I stated that it was a, a limitation in our testing of the model. Um, I'm, I'm saying that the data that we used to test the model was from chronic exposures, and it's unknown what the um, uh, how well acute data or acute exposures um, would would um, be modeled by mm. the um, the adjusted model. Um, so, however, the original Leggett model, um, you know, did did do testing on um, shorter term exposures. Um, so that's that's why I made that statement. Okay. Um, can anyone comment, and perhaps Leslie, you might be able to do this since you actually maybe do this sort of thing for a living. Can you comment on ZPP levels and cumulative lead exposure from a scientific standpoint, clinical standpoint? Is there any utility at all in taking ZPP measurements? Actually, um, Wilma did make a comment about this in um, 2009 and in 2012. And we said, we agreed, we supported what Barbara's indicated about that there's no role for ZPP when the blood levels are below 30. Mm. Um, Okay. I, I, Go ahead. I would just say I think for routine monitoring. For, for yeah, routine monitoring. And but for evaluation of a case, which we do see, we would then consider use of ZPP and other methods. Right. You know, if you see. So, so for it, diagnosis, it, yes. For monitoring, if, no. That you, is correct. If you see somebody with a high blood lead and then you measure their ZPP and their ZPP is low, that suggests that the exposure was relatively recent within the past few weeks. <laughs> So earlier studies showed men of reproductive age exposed to lead had difficulty conceiving or having healthy kids, if, quote, if I remember rightly. Why recommend lower levels for women only? What about first having a level that protects the most vulnerable and avoiding discrimination against women? Well, I'll start, because I put up this slide, I'll, and then please follow up. Um, I, what I said when I presented the results about uh, that uh, were evaluated by NTP and EPA was that 
um, you know, there is evidence of effects on male reproduction, but those effects are observed at higher lead levels than the ones that we're, that we're focusing on for the cardiovascular uh, and hypertension effects. So that, um, you know, if we're going to reduce exposures to keep people below, below 10 or below 5, then uh, the reproductive effects on males should be, you know, a adequately addressed. Okay. Anybody else? No, only, only the, the, the philosophical point I try to make in my talk is that I think occupational standards should be set at levels that protect the most vulnerable people in the population. And in this instance, the most vulnerable is the fetus that a pregnant woman worker carries to work with her. And that levels that protect the fetus are certainly going to protect adult males. Okay. Yeah. Right. Are, we, are we saying the same thing? Yeah. So I'm not sure who had this reference. Uh, what's the reference for the um, 1.2 microgram per deciliter for U.S. adults? I think it was you. It was not recently in the NHENS ABLES report. Didn't you show the 1.2? Yeah, 1. yeah. 2? I, I think I showed 1. Somebody wants to know I, the I, reference. I think Barbara mentioned 1.2. I think I, I mentioned 1.1. 1. 1. Maybe it's, it's 1.2 for the adult population and 1.1 1. 1 for the general population. For the general population. population. But it, it comes from NHANES data. It comes from NHANES. If, if you go on um, to the National Center for Environmental Health website, they, ha they have updated their, their, uh, their, their data from the uh, NHANES uh, portion that they do every couple of years, and the most recent data uh, reflects those numbers. Okay. So could Dr. Kosnett please comment on how to interpret studies that are finding positive results for bone lead, but not blood lead, or vice versa? Um, is there a possible explanation for this, especially when this finding occurs in the same cohort? If bone lead is a more accurate measure of cumulative exposure, how do we interpret the results of studies that focus only on blood lead? Uh, blood lead reflects both uh, recent and chronic exposure. I mean, it reflects recent external exposure, and it also reflects um, the uh, equilibration or the uh, contribution of lead from bone into blood. So blood lead is a, is a hybrid, uh, if you will. Mm. Bone lead mm. is a better marker of uh, long-term cumulative exposure. So I think the data um, indicates that with endpoints like cardiovascular disease uh, and hypertension, it's uh, the long-term cumulative exposure which results in the risk. And that's borne out uh, by um, observations, too, on the, on the pharmacodynamics of lead. If you have a short-term exposure to lead, your blood pressure doesn't jump up. Okay. It, it, that just doesn't happen. Uh, it, it's the long-term cumulative exposure. And so that's why in these studies that have measured both, uh, lead in bone and lead in blood, it's the lead in bone which is the greater predictor in most studies of, um, of the uh, risks such as hypertension. Now, we have seen, and I did show some studies, that showed a relationship between blood lead and blood pressure. And to a certain extent, that still exists, even though it's not the short-term exposure. It's because people today, if you take a general population, people who have higher blood leads today probably had higher cumulative exposure as well, if, you're, if it's a large study, if it's a large study. So in the NHANES studies, those who have higher blood leads, their blood lead is probably reflecting the fact that they have had longer accumulation of lead in the bone and that, that's why their blood lead level is high today. So I don't think there's an inconsistency. Uh, I, I think that uh, overall it's cons the, the findings from the studies are consistent. So Barbara, we're going to Stockholm now. Should the California Department of Public Health be recommending a lower PEL for women aged 50 and younger, as in Sweden? I am not an expert on what they do in Sweden. <laughs> I've been in California for a lot of for herring. Long a lot I of think that there. was uh, a reference to Dr. Kosnitz's slide that showed the medical removal protection levels in the different countries, and uh, you know they all looked pretty high to me. So, you know, Sweden ought to look at lowering their MRP level as well. <laughs> 
Well, we'll, we'll telephone them right after the... Uh... Okay, so uh, have the eight-hour time-weighted averages produced using the Leggett Plus model taken into account dietary exposure and smoking exposure as contributing factors to the blood lead? We did incorporate a background level of 1.5 uh, that led to that leads to a uh, 1.5 micrograms per deciliter in the blood. So that was incorporated into the uh, calculation of an eight-hour time-weighted average. Okay. So a follow-up could need to see information on younger workers who were not alive in 1970s. Would this information affect the model? And then I'm sure the questioner doesn't mean this in a pejorative sense to your reviewers, but has this information been submitted to more experienced reviewers at Federal OSHA, <laughs> NIOSH, and ACGIH? If, if so, what was their response? If not, why? It wasn't meant personally at you, Dale, uh, at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, on behalf of Dr. Vork, uh, <laughs> did, you want to, did you want to respond to Kathy? I now even forget what the first part Yeah, the was. first part of it is information on younger workers who are not alive in 1970s. W wouldn't this information affect the model? How would, how would having a cohort of people who were born millennials affect your model? So you're saying the people that have a lower background? I think that's what the questioner is after. Uh, people who are not alive in 1970 may be, have a lower background level. As opposed to the, the, the data that oh, now, we Now, see, we you're going used. too far here now. You st <laughs> I'm supposed to ask the questions here, OK? <laughs> that someone has submitted to me. So no cross-examination is allowed. <laughs> By the way, have you submitted it to Federal OSHA and IOSH and AC? You could answer that one. <laughs> my, my, understand, my, you know, my understanding of the, uh, of the model and the legged model is, uh, you know, it, it incorporates uh, a movement of lead between compartments that is governed by age. Uh, I mean, the legged model, the core legged model, uh, uh, had um, some age dependence to the movement of lead in and out of bone, and I think... Uh, I think it would, uh, I see no reason to believe that the model would not function uh, with people who are younger and had shorter, uh, lower background cumulative exposure. So I'm confident that the model would be valid. Um, the data sets uh, that were available for use uh, to uh, validate the model were based on individuals who had um, higher exposures. Uh, but the um, inputs to the model and the pharmacokinetics uh, are uh, applicable to people from younger ages. Yes, I just want to add to that that uh, when we modeled the exposures for adults, we started with a um, beginning blood lead level, um, which incorporates any background level. So it could be, um, you know, less than one, or it could be twenty. So that it's completely flexible in that model. Okay, so you want me to take on this FedOSHA? Yeah, sure, NIOSH, why not? ACGH. Why not? So, you know, this, the, the report uh, summarizing OEHA's work just came out, what, about a month ago, Kathy? And this is the first public presentation. And uh, we know that there are NIOSH and federal OSHA people uh, attending by webinar. Uh, and we expect they'll be reading the report and seeing what they think of it. And we, uh, yeah. It's oh, and it's posted on the website, so it's available for the public to look at. And um, you know, so sooner than later, ho hopefully, it'll be published um, in the peer-reviewed uh, scientific literature as well. We hope uh, that's the plan. And so, you know, this is this is the first day of presenting it and getting to pose questions to Kathy. But uh, our information is in the packet. You know, any of us who are speakers today. Uh, you know, we'll entertain further questions about it. Leslie? As I recall, the meeting started with this is a historical day. I believe one of the speakers mentioned that. I also believe that California seems to be the mover and the shaker. And uh, well, apparently shaker, we yes. have an shaker, ATD standard, yes. and we have a diacetyl standard, which I, as I recall, 
Fetto she doesn't have. So um, let's I, not get nasty. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm responding to the to the person who asked this question, and so um, with all due respect to the person who asked the question, we hope that today will um, foster um, some more questioning of this. Be that's a beautiful answer. Thank you. So so Kathy, why is a p value of zero point one five considered acceptable for the Leggett Plus model? Why not consider a p-value of 0 0.05? It was in one of your slides. I remember the. I remember that. Yes, it signifies um, no difference, which is what we were uh, looking for. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like Dr. Haddis to. Ex yeah, the he p did such an eloquent job of explaining it. Yeah, the p-value is the probability that you would get as large a difference between your prediction and your observation. Uh, as you see by chance for random statistical fluctuations. So what a p-value of 0.15 means is that there's at least a 15% chance of seeing a difference as large as, as was found between the predicted levels and the observed levels. And so it, it means that you don't reject the null hypothesis in that case that, there, that the model is, is, is correct. Okay, um, so it's a different than what the uh, author might have I imagined. Okay, so Dr. Landrigan, how do we interpret results of studies on several developmental effects of lead where an association is positive for one parameter such as low birth weight but not s small for gest gestational age or head circumference even within the same cohort? Each of those endpoints has its own dynamic, and there's no a priori reason to think that lead would have the same effect on each of those outcomes. I see. Okay. Yes. Birth weight is a, a really sensitive parameter that you can get significant effects because of it's a con it can, it's a continuous parameter. Mm -hmm. It has a lot more information than a quantal or a parameter that's interpreted as quantal, like small for gestational. Age. So it just takes a lot more information in the data to be to reach statistical significance. So you want you don't want to interpret a negative response as saying that there's nothing there, but you want to say it's not large enough for us to have found it by our usual statistical criteria. That's great. So uh, it's uh, three forty. We're going to uh, conclude here in a few minutes. So I've gone through all the ones uh, our web questions. I want to make sure that the web folks were taken care of, and I've got a few others. But I wanted to also open it up to see whether uh, folks had you. Can we get uh, this gentleman a microphone um, so that he could be heard? Thank you. Just going back to what was uh, discussed a little while ago, as an employer. Uh, and without taking any position on proposed new PELs, it's really important for us to test and to sample so that we know where we have exposures, if our uh, control measures are effective and you know where they're not, where we need PELs. So it's, I, I think it's really important, I agree strongly with Barbara, that sampling needs to continue and we can't just depend on blood leads. I would say that the typical sampling that we do has a reporting limit of quantification above two typically. So there are some potential challenges there at very low levels. My question is, would testing bone lead be a better measure for protecting workers long term? And is there any practical way to do this in an occupational medicine arena? Well, I, right now the, the technology is, uh, is, is not um, practical, I don't think, for having uh, routine availability at lead at work sites uh, across the country. Um, also, remember that the lead in bone reflects a long-term accumulation. So a person could run up some short-term, potentially deleterious effects, for example, on reproductive outcomes before they would manifest an increase in, uh, in bone lead. Uh, you know, technology uh, may change. Uh, in the future, 20 years from now, there may be other devices uh, that are available uh, that could do it very quickly and sensitively and it perhaps might add valuable information. But right now, uh, it's not practical. And uh, we, were, we were talking at last time of practical limitations. There's only two or three instruments in North America. 
for doing bone lead. That's, it's the same basic physics as the handheld XRF that you use to sample paint in an old house or, or to look for lead in the soil, but the, the, sens the highly sensitive, very precise detector that's needed for the bone lead, we've got one at Mount Sinai, my friend Andy Todd, whom you mentioned, Michael, and um, I think there's one in Toronto, Howard Who, and um, there may be no others. Argon and lead. Argon, you mentioned that lunchtime, time. That's right. Thanks. Short follow up, and then we have to go to another question. Just, some of the things we've been talking about today are based on the the intent of changing the regulations is to address these long term, over the entire work uh, life kind of issues. And if we can't test for them, mm -hmm. and if the blood leads aren't really predictive or protective of them, um, are we at kind of cross purposes here? Or are we not really examining? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think that, uh, you know, you can't look at a blood lead today and necessarily uh, infer the person's past exposure. But if, we're, if we have a worker in the workplace and we're monitoring their blood lead and we're seeing that over their tenure at the workplace, their blood leads don't get above 10, then we, be, then we can be confident that they're not accumulating long-term exposure. Other question here in the auditorium? I saw, a, yes. Sir. No, we need it for the web. Uh, oh, okay, good point. Okay, uh, this is for Dr. Materna, and I apologize if I uh, butchered your name. Uh, two quick questions, they'll be easy. I went to a D2 school. Um, what <laughs> triggers testing, what mandatory testing in California? Uh, are you talking about blood lead testing? Yes. What, what is the trigger? Uh, exceeding the action level of 30 micrograms per cubic meter for more than 30 days a year. Okay, so this, this is part of your problem for uh, collecting month. the data? 30 days a year, sorry. So, so this is part of the problem collecting the data? Is there's people out there that don't know that they've hit that mark? Uh, in our experience, there are many uh, employers out there, particularly small employers, who just don't do air monitoring. Uh, not, you know, I mean, I think the people in the room here are, are pretty darn familiar with the lead standards, but that doesn't mean that that awareness, you know, extends across all industries, you know, large, among large and small employers. So yes, uh, air monitoring, you know, costs a certain amount of money, takes a certain amount of sophistication. There are many workplaces that don't have an industrial hygienist or health and safety professional who can conduct air monitoring, so they have to hire consultants. So. For whatever reasons, there, you know, there are a lot of employers that don't do it, and yes, then they're not technic, you know, and they're not required under the current Kalosha standard. Then, you know, they don't know what their air lead levels are, so they're not required. So, the recommendation that we made is to devise some criteria for what a lead workplace is. You know, something that focuses on lead is disturbed or used in a way that it can be released into the environment, you know, not just solid lead that sits there undisturbed, but some, you know, process that dis disturbs lead uh, should be the trigger for when uh, putting your workers in the blood lead monitoring program, uh, you know, must be done. Okay, and then the second thing, just so I'm clear on what I think you said, <laughs> is, okay, your, your recommendation was an MRP of 30 and then a return to work at two consecutive 20s. Uh, no, that's, that's not correct. So uh, it was one blood lead of 30 or higher would initiate re medical removal, or two at 20. Uh, okay. You know, when you get up uh, above a certain level, then you do more frequent blood lead testing. So say you did it four weeks apart, and it was still above 20, that that would be enough uh, to require medical removal protection. And then what's the return to work level? Well, we recommended, a, a, you know, this This is back from our expert lead panel and the EHP group. We recommended a return level of 15, which I think some people could validly say is, you know, inconsistent with our current recommendation that people stay below 10. Uh, but, you know, that was the recommendation that, w that we made it at that a time. And the PEL was 2-1? The PEL recommendation uh, we gave is a range of 0 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter to 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, the lower number would keep 95% of workers under 5, their blood leads, 
uh, and the, the higher end of the range, 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter, would keep 95% of workers under 10 micrograms per deciliter. Michael, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'd like yeah. to just add uh, a point for emphasis for people to uh, realize, too, is that um, the goal is to keep people long-term with blood leads under 10. The fact that medical removal is not triggered until 20 doesn't mean that it's fine and okay to keep people long-term with blood leads in the teens. Uh, I think that the message that I want you to take home is that if you have blood levels in the teens, we want you to take action. We recommend on a health basis you take action to lower those levels. Medical removal, which is a fairly uh, severe and you know uh, extensive action, is uh, is at 20. But that doesn't you know doesn't mean that our guidance is that below 20 is fine. Okay, we'd like people to go below 10. If you have people who are in the teens, take action. But consider removing them based on the situation. But definitely try to structure your long-term goal so it's less than uh, 10. And then if you're above 20, it's gotten to the point where you have to remove the person if it's repeated at a level of, you know, if it's repeated again in four weeks. And I think that's an important take-home point for people to get. Other questions in the auditorium? Gentlemen? Um, you mentioned that there was traces of lead found in the ovili. Is that did I hear that? Or as far as uh, the respirable dust, you're talking about you're finding evidence of lead in the ovili. Alveoli. Alveoli. Excuse me. In the deep lung, I think Kathy, you mentioned that in in the deposition analysis that um, I showed that there was um, lead that deposited in the um, deep lung as well as the upper respiratory. Is that what you're asking? Yes, because I'm currently I know we're not we're not doing a lot of testing during chest x-rays for looking for lead, right? Is that? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it wouldn't I don't think lead would show up on a chest x-ray, not these not these tiny fine particles. It's just you just can't, the, the instrument just isn't sensitive enough to pick it up. Question from the gentleman in the back. Well, there. It's, that's where it's absorbed from. Yes. So it would be absorbed or then coughed up, gotten rid of. So it's a combination. But that's how it gets absorbed into the body. The Sir? smallest particles go into deep into the lung and then directly into the blood. Um. Sure, go ahead. Any thought on the surface level of lead, which would be, um, uh, which would raise concern? My understanding is that. Uh, uh, you know, that's sort of all over the map in terms of the HUD levels and what OSHA recommends. I think the Fed level is like 200 micrograms per, per square foot. Uh, what's considered, what would be considered to be a problem at the PEL levels that you're recommending? I don't have an answer for that today. Um, we were originally asking OEHA to do some work looking at uh, service contaminations and the goal of that would be to try to, def to try to use modeling to define a level of lead on the surfaces that uh, would be sort of a limit for clean areas. You know, so like lunchrooms or places where workers uh, eat, uh, their change rooms, you know, we want to make sure that ingestion is not occurring there. So that was where we were looking at possibly determining uh, a criteria, a numerical criteria for, um, you know, what a clean space is. Uh, that work got, uh, you know, is available sort of in draft form, but we, due to the feasi time constraints and feasibility, um, you know, didn't uh, finalize it at this point in time. Did you have a follow-up question, sir? Yes, thank you. Uh, and that'll take into account the, um, the soil lead levels, which is a you know, varies quite a bit um, around the country and around the region. Another question in the auditorium? Yes, ma'am. This was asked a little bit earlier, but if you could expand on it. It seems that you validated your model using the ASARCO data, which are people that are pretty much exposed to a consistent level of lead eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, and they have very consistent exposure. Many of the workers who are exposed to lead today 
are exposed in construction where you're gonna have very intermittent types of exposure. Could you do a little further addressing of how well you think the model addresses intermittent exposures to lead, such as construction activities, where you may have a worker that's exposed for an hour here, two hours there, but they're not getting a 40-hour exposure in a week? We have modeled that, and that is a capability of the model. We just uh, did not include that in the report. Um, it is something to be examined, um, the intermittent exposure scenario. Um, there is a component of the model that um, has a nonlinear um, behavior, and so um, it is something to explore that uh, at high spikes and you know um, intermittent exposures could be slightly different than a than uh, um, it evaluating something as a constant exposure, it is something to further explore. And, and the model has the capability of doing that, but uh, we didn't have data to actually explore um, how well it predicts from um, the data that we have. The, the part of the model that has that nonlinearity is the uh, relationship between whole blood lead and lead in the plasma. Uh, and, and our initially looking at the, the constants that are built into the model, it looks like there's a reasonably rapid equilibri equilibration. So if that's the case, then it should tend to, to, to uh, average out things over, over time pretty well. But it needs to be tested as to how rapidly that equilibration really happens. Other questions in the auditorium? Okay. Well, um, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, all seven of our uh, speakers today. And I want to thank all of you for coming and for all of you who provided questions for the panelists. Uh, I think we had a wonderful day, and as Dr. Landrigan told us, it is an historic day, as Dr. Israel uh, conf also confirmed. This is an historic day, so remember this day. Tell your grandchildren about it. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everyone on online, and especially those of you who are in time zones other than ours. So safe travels home. John. John. No, your, your presentation was fabulous because it assembled so much. Leslie, thank you. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, she's she's fabulous.